Hello, hello to anybody watching. Sorry about being uh, late and gay. I know I said it'd be about 20 minutes, but now it's like what? I guess it's technically been 30 minutes. I don't know, 20 minutes past seven. Yeah, I meant to do that. All right. So let's get into it. Uh, all righty. We got, I believe, oh, let me check and make sure this thing is still, this thing running. Oh. Okay, there we go. Well, let me skip past this. Okay. All right, so we got a little bit of chill music because we're going to be talking about something that's kind of not so chill today all right let's see let me get a window up here for i believe i have one okay let me add one for the browser uh yeah mm. Ah, I knew exactly where to go. Alrighty. Uh, okay, so. This up here, let me check this really quick. I'm gonna be watching quite a few videos. Uh, we're gonna be, uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, 1.5 speeding past a couple of videos here, but I'm gonna tell you guys, you know, what's What's what? What's going on? What is going on? Also, if anybody wants to come and join me on stream, you can just uh, message me, uh, DM me in Twitter or something, and uh, we'll make it happen. All right, let me check through the settings on here and just kind of, you know, make sure. And everything is hunky dory. Uh, okay. I did um, duck, duck, go onion. Right, sure. Um, privacy. Uh, sure, okay. Uh, so Well, I guess we can, yeah, we could probably do that. Okay. Home. Okay. Blank page. All right. Think. And then we got extensions and themes. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. What do we want to do? Come on, come on. There we go. I don't want to blur out your eyeballs with uh, dark text on a white background, so. Um, YouTube installation, yes. And let's see, what's the next add on I usually put on here? Oh, that's right. Uh, let's see. Um, U block? U block. That'll be the next one put on here. U block origin. All right. Add to. Continue to installation. Downloading and verify. It's like a terrifying circus. Ready. Add. Wow. Okay, and then uh decentralized. I uh, probably don't need to worry too much about this add-on, but I don't know, I'll just add it anyway. Okay. 
You can tell where my brain's been all day. Uh, let's see. Close some of these tabs. Don't worry, it'll come on in a second. So I basically spent most of my day today uh, researching monkeypox, which has been fun. Um, not really. Uh, not not so good developments going on in that uh, that uh, field, which is why I'm not streaming on Twitch or YouTube. Because uh, we're going to get into some spicy stuff today on the stream. And uh, it's going to, I don't know, I, it's the kind of stuff that you could maybe be picked off Twitch for or YouTube. So I'm only streaming on some of the lesser known platforms and of course Odyssey. Thank God for Odyssey. All right. Okay, I think we're ready to show the window. And we can probably stretch this out a good amount. Or wait, hold on. What if I, okay. Yeah, so if I really wanna show this window, I should probably just stretch out the window itself. Uh. Okay, let's see. Let's bring that up a little bit. Yeah, okay. That should be good. I'll make sure that I'm seeing everything I want to see. All right, am I seeing everything? Yeah. Looks like I'm seeing everything. Excellent. Maybe take that back down. Or browser back up. Okay. So, let's get into some of the uh, dangerous articles. All right, so, um, where should I start? Um, I feel like I could maybe start with Peak Prosperity. He did a video uh, about seven days ago. we would probably start there before we move on to the article. Let's see here. Uh, probably need to capture method. Okay, I guess if, in order to stream sound, we're gonna have to mute the desktop. Which okay, we can do that. Sure. Donation. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Sure. That's all. Okay, oh yeah, okay, we definitely stretched that out there now, didn't we? All right, let's, let's bring that back down. Bring that back down. Down, down, down. All right. So I guess we'll start, we'll start off with uh, the Peak Prosperity video because that one kind of came out first uh, and it, uh, I mean, he goes over some really important stuff, um, and then it'll be easier to kind of build on top of that later. So I think maybe I'll start there. Let's, um, let's tone down the background just a little bit. There we go. Uh, let's see. It's probably barely audible, but that's okay. Okay, peak prosperity is Martinson. Uh, he's got, always got uh, nice relaxing titles to his videos. Okay. Let's go to the channel. Mm. 
and we want to look at this one. This is what we are going to be talking about in this video. We're going to be going over, unfortunately, monkeypox. God, I think it's, yeah, or it's not well, another resource. Uh, and then we've got Twitter. Com. Twitter. Twitter Twatter. Twitter Twatter. Twitter Twatter. Uh, just, uh, yeah. Okay, there we go. Fire that up. Connection timed out. Oh, do I just need to try again? Okay, it looks like it's going to load. All right, that's good. All righty, here we go. There's always interesting stuff here. So this is going to be uh, a, re a combination of a showing and a research stream because there's stuff that I already know about. And, of course, we're going to keep continuing to look throughout the stream for more stuff related to the ongoing new pandemic. I, I just, I knew that this was going to be a thing. Um, was it Bill Gates was saying back in November, 2021, like that the next pandemic would going to be like a smallpox thing. And I'm just like, how does this motherfucker know? You know what I mean? Oh. Uh, forgot. Hold on, let's go to uh, settings, add-ons. Let's search for add-ons. Uh, onion. There's a particular onion add-on that I really like. It um sort of has like a whitelist or a redirect list of onion sites, and so you basically go to the onion site instead of the clarinet site. Um, Newer Tor browsers do have a feature to redirect you to Onion Sites. I don't like it because I've seen it, uh, I've, I've watched it in action, and it, it'll sometimes take you to the ClearNet site first and then realize that there's an Onion Site, and then it'll load the Onion Site, which could de-anonymize you. So that's already a no-go for me. However, this add-on right here takes you straight to the Onion Site if there is one available without you know first contacting the ClearNet site to ask for the Onion address. I I always use this one. I like it. A lot. Okay. So I guess there is an onion site for Twitter. That's cool. I didn't I suspected I didn't really know though. Alrighty, so uh, I don't know if I see any particular uh All right. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay, well, we'll continue to monitor that as it loads. And of course, uh, we have, yeah. Redirect clear net requests to trusted Onion domain. Yep, exactly. All without having to contact the clear net site first. All right. We're going to be watching this one. Let's take up the speed here. Let's do playback speed. No, no. What are you doing? Come on. What are you fucking doing? Okay. We are going to be watching this at a rather quick speed because we have a lot of videos to get through. When it comes to monkeypox, the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. Hello everyone, Dr. Chris Martinson here with your monkeypox episode. Of course, a lot of people have been asking for it, and we're going to talk about it. Hey, here's the punchline. There's not that much to worry about, but we do have to worry about the official reactions to it. It's been way overplayed, and I really want to dive into that. In fact, hey, we get to learn something about uh, everything we look into. And of course, I want to start with this video because he does cover some really important stuff to go over about, uh, well, you'll see. But uh, there's, obviously been, there's obviously been updates since this video. So unfortunately, some of his, uh, some of his take is a little out of date. 
but we'll go over that here in a bit. Okay, so we're going to be learning about monkeypox, pox viruses a little bit, and actually the official reactions to all this. So let's go take a look, jump right in here. Uh, episode 62, should you be worried? Short answer is no. And look, we're seeing charts like this. By the way, that's it, r slash monkeypox over on Reddit. <laughs> the first three days of that uh, subreddit, that was actually a pretty cool place to go. But then it got taken over by a mod from r coronavirus, and so it's now just an echo chamber of centrist positions. And they love, what does the centrist love right now? They love charts like this. That chart looks exponential. Case, case, cluster, cluster, boom. Oh my gosh. Look at the total number of confirmed monkey pox cases since the first case. That's 162 worldwide out of nearly, you know, eight plus billion people. So what do we know about monkeypox? Hey, it's really typically not deadly, depending on the clade we're talking about. The clade is the family, the family that we have going on around the world right now. It's not really a deadly uh, clade or family version of that. I'll show you more on that in just a second. It's really only transmitted by close contact, in fact, sexual contact, hey, with symptomatic people. So it's kind of easily avoided. It has an R naught of less than one, meaning one person transmits it on average to less than one other person, which means this is a virus that goes out of business all on its own. And by the way, if you do have high-risk groups, they are easily and thoroughly pr uh, protected with vaccination. So we're going to talk about that vaccine real quick because that's been back in the news again. So let's go there. All right. Um, first, good news. There are no genetic surprises in this particular virus right now. So that's a, a good sign for me because, of course, you know, SARS-CoV-2 came out of a laboratory. 99.95% sure on that. I'm not a very, very small chance that it's not. Got some bad news for you guys, but we'll get into that in a bit. Okay, so it hasn't been monkeyed around within a laboratory. That's good news. So here's the actual family tree of all the variants that from the first detected version back in the 1970s, I think, the early 1970s. They've all been sequenced of the ones that have been sequenced. Those two in yellow right there show the current family structure of the, of the variants that we're seeing out in public right now. So no big deal. I can track the lineage. There's nothing surprising so far in any of the genetic analyses that I've seen, so that's really good news. Um, and what do we know about the pox and the pox family? This includes, here's the whole pox family. You've got monkeypox in there, and it's related to cowpox and vaccinia virus. That includes um, the vaccinia gives us to smallpox and things like that. So that's the family. It's an orthopox. Good news for people who have been exposed to orthopox uh, vaccines in the past. You are probably protected from this monkeypox as well. So let's go down that. Uh, here are the human poxes. So first we got the uh, variola major and variola minor, that's smallpox. Smallpox been in the news a lot lately. People have been hearing about it. Of course, we're very scared of smallpox. But smallpox is very deadly, 30% fatality. Last naturally occurring case diagnosed in October 1977, uh, according to the WHO, so it's been out of business. They stopped giving smallpox vaccines in 1980, I believe. So I actually have a small circular scar on my arm from where I received the smallpox vaccine as a child. That was a thing when I was growing up. Now, carrying on, uh, this is the vaccinia virus, and move that. Um, this is a really interesting, large, complex, it's an envelope virus. Um, it is, like monkeypox, a double-stranded DNA genome. Here's the cool thing about having these double-stranded DNA viruses. They tend not to mutate very rapidly at all. The reason is that they have two strands of DNA, and they've incorporated proteins that read those for copy errors. So they're actually proofreading themselves while they're manufacturing themselves in your cells. So uh, that means that they're not going to have that much genetic variation over time. It's going to be very slow, not like the single-stranded RNA of SARS-CoV-2, the COVID virus, because that thing, single-stranded RNA, highly, highly subject to mutations. It's highly variable. You get a lot of mutations. You get these very complicated family trees, and you see very aggressive mutations. Not the case. So if we did see, suddenly, surprise, uh, a monkeypox come out with a lot of genetic variation in it, that would be, for me, immediate evidence that some humans had been actually tinkering with the genetic code. So why am I bringing up the vaccinia virus? Because that, really cool. When smallpox was coming around, Edward Jenner, back in 1798, figured out that you could actually use cowpox to vaccinate people in a way that would cause them not to get smallpox. Then they settled on using this stuff. The vaccinia virus also immunizes people against smallpox. Look at the name, vaccinia virus. That is actually, this is the virus responsible for the term vaccine, vaccination. It comes from the vaccinia virus name itself. So that's where vaccination began with this particular virus right here in this family structure. When you give the vaccinia virus to people, they still have a reaction to it. Here's a site of an injection of a vaccinia virus. And you see it causes that, that very typical swelling that we have going on right there. And that blistery center, that then forms the scar that like I have in my arm, it looks like a little depression in the skin uh, because of the vaccinia virus. That's a live virus. Your body reacts to it, reacts to it, creates that little red pustule thing right there that becomes a scar over time. And because of that reaction to that, you have lifelong protection against smallpox as a disease. So that's how vaccination all got started. And then of course we come into monkeypox itself. And again, double-stranded DNA, a zoonotic virus, meaning it mostly has an animal reservoir, kicks around in animals, sometimes jumps over into humans. It doesn't really hang out in humans a lot. Um, with an R naught below one, tends to go away. All right, so that's the pox families right there. These are the three that infect humans. There are a lot of other pox viruses out there, but these are the three that actually can infect humans. Vaccinia virus, really not that big a deal. doesn't tend to cause all that much uh, in humans. It causes a local site reaction like that when you inject it. But otherwise, it's a very mild form of an illness for humans. Monkeypox, a little bit less mild. Um, you'll get flu-like symptoms if you get it. Eventually, you'll end up with a rash. If it goes even further, you might get a rash with little pustules on it. But 
really not, not that hard of a case compared to smallpox, which is really bad. However, what is bad about monkeypox? The fear porn that's been coming out. It's a huge concern. Look at this. This just came out, I think, yesterday uh, in the UK. Monkeypox, the National Health Service, NHS, issues warning to anyone who eats meat. That's <laughs> UK case advice. Really, a warning to anyone who eats meat. <sighs> Here we are with that Davos, uh, you know, you, nobody should be eating meat sort of a thing. Somehow that got linked to monkeypox. How did they do that? How did they manage to just tie that right back around? Maybe next climate change. You never know what they're going to tie monkeypox to. But look at this. The NHS here issued a warning to meat eaters amid a significant and concerning outbreak of monkeypox in the UK. Significant and concerning. Is it significant? With 162 cases worldwide, it's not yet significant at all. Why it's concerning, not clear about this, particularly when I'll show you the evidence later about how... Oh, are we buffering? Oh no, there's a little bit of buffering going on. Uh, let's see. There's nothing I can do about it except wait for it to finish loading. Uh, okay. We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay, we're going to search Twitter. We're going to be searching for... Mm -hmm. There we go. You can search Twitter for what's going on. Uh, did I? Okay, still on here. All right. Let's continue on. This has actually been spread so far. It's neither significant nor concerning, but the NHS in the UK would like you to think it is. And plus, look at this. According to the NHS website, monkeypox can be spread by touching clothing, bedding, or towels used by an infected person. Touching monkeypox blisters or scabs, ill-advised, or the coughs or sneezes of a person infected by the disease. However, the infection can also be spread by animals and eating meat. Well, maybe bush meat. I mean, if you're eating monkey meat out in, in the jungle, probably a bad idea for a lot of reasons. This would be one of them. But at any rate, that's fear porn right there. It has nothing to do with nothing. Check this out. Next, um, World Health Organization confirms 90... All right, we're going to skip ahead a little bit here to some more relevant data because not everything he says here is relevant to us right now. Basically, he just talks about how the, the WHO put out a statement saying that uh, monkeypox has a 10% uh, case fatality rate and uh, debunks that and talks about how that's not true. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here because he's going to talk about some of the players in the, um, the event 201. And he's also going to talk a little bit about... Uh, if you guys know, there was a similar, I don't know what they called it, uh, but it was kind of a similar event to a one type deal or they ran in 2021 where they simulated a smallpox outbreak of a, of a lab engineered smallpox that escaped from a lab in March. And, uh, wow, wouldn't you know it? Uh, we start getting uh, some real ratchety, uh, we start seeing the, the media starts ratcheting up uh, talk about uh, monkeypox on March 20th of 2022. So, of course, I'm sure there's no connection there. We're close to 10%, unlike, um, well, this is, this is Spencer Kimball, come on, this is really easily researched, and I know you have quick deadlines and all that, but as of May 21st, this was not a responsible thing to say. That's an irresponsible statement, and uh, I think the CDC even would agree with that. So, but here, uh, this is a WHO official um, saying, uh, we need to be on the lookout for this in countries that typically don't typically experience smallpox. So we've been working with countries to expand surveillance to look for people who've had a rash. A rash? That's it? We're going we're gonna to whoop up some panic around a rash? What the... A lot of things can cause a rash. Poison ivy, changing your soap, uh, having, who knows? There's a, lots of things that can cause a rash. So now they're working with surveillance as key. Oi, I don't agree with that, uh, that we really have to get all that excited about it. And, and look at this. Uh, one case of monkeypox found in Massachusetts this weekend in less than 48 hours. The United States government had purchased 13 million monkeypox vaccines for $119 million. What a waste of money there. A day later, Pfizer received FDA approval for a new monkeypox vaccine. Think of the odds. That's amazing. Just a day later? That's astonishing how fast that happened. Belgium now requiring mandatory 21-day quarantine for monkeypox patients and Britain advising high-risk close contacts of monkeypox victims or whatever we call them uh, to isolate for 21 days. Swedish health ministry looking at possible restrictions because of the outbreak. Look at all of these immediate reactions. You'd think that monkeypox was this big, amazing, what a, what a huge 
public health emergency this is. We're going to have to get right on this. We're going to have to get right on this right away. In fact, they did. So listen, is this just because, you know, post-COVID, everybody's schooled up and they know how to turn that virus crank and so they get really excited? Or is it something else? I think it's something else. And I'm going to show you why here real quick. So first up, it's kind of nasty looking, right? Look at that rare monkeypox cases reported from U.S. First time in nearly 20 years. Here's all you need to know. But, but look at that. Under, under that awful picture on that hand, it says rare monkeypox cases. Hmm. So the, the, it's kind of indicating that's a picture of monkeypox. It doesn't really look like monkeypox. What does it look like? Oh, that's right. It kind of looks like shingles. Um, so Queensland Health <laughs> in Australia uh, a while back uh, used the same picture to talk about what it looks like when you have shingles. In fact, that's what shingles blisters do look like. So again, is this just, it's amazing how much sloppy journalism you can get when suddenly it gets into this mysterious world of viruses because then all of a sudden they lose their ability to distinguish between cases and infections using the right images. It's just astonishing all the things that suddenly become very difficult to do that used to be part of what we would call journalism. Yo, yo, what's up, Ego? Uh, if you want to join in, uh, just uh, send me a DM. If you want to join on, hop on, but yeah, no. So all I'm doing right now is we're just talking about monkeypox. All right. So here's the deal. We're going over, we're going over some old, uh, videos right now. Um, cause, uh, Chris Martinson, he, this video is old. Some of the info is a little bit out of date, unfortunately. Um, and he's, um, right now he's just kind of going over. So you all, we all know, I'm sure we've all heard by now, 2021, the who ran another one of its infamous training exercises. Uh, you all remember in 2019, they had the exercise for a novel coronavirus that escaped from a lab. They ran that exercise in 2019 and late 2019, lo and behold, what do you think happened? Wow. Novel coronavirus escapes from a lab. Never happened before. Um, well, they did another exercise. I don't have you on discord. Give me your number. Okay. Uh, let's see. My number. Uh, let's see. What is my number? Let me look that up. So anyway, they did another one on, um, tw March of 2021, where they simulated an outbreak of lab engineered monkeypox. Oh, so, God damn it. Where is the code? Yeah. Oh. There we go. Uh, what is my number? Oh, there we go. Number is... Oh, are you about to do your cardio? Oh, okay. Well, this is going to go on for a while, so don't feel like you got to join in right away. But uh, I'm post that in the chat here. Uh, let's see. Number is, there we go. You want to friend me on Discord, that's the number. All right. So, that is what we're talking about right now. So, obviously, we've had a pre-training exercise, right, for uh, what is a, a um, novel monkeypox virus that was released from a lab in the training simulation. The pox virus was released on March 15th, and in March of 2022, on March 20th, suddenly we start getting uh, news articles about um, a monkey pox virus that is spreading because of a couple of gay orgies in Spain. Now, we are we are we are being told that this this um, virus current virus had its sort of initial origin or introduction in through a gay fetish event in both Spain and one in the Netherlands. Although the uh, highest case count right now is in the UK, which may or may not make sense. Um, anyway, so that's that's kind of where we're at right now. And that is so we're gonna watch through the rest of this video because, like I said, he's got some good info on some of the key players behind this um, training simulation that was run the previous year. Many of them are people who were involved in the 2019 pandemic simulation. They focused a lot on uh, not on uh, not on helping people or curing people or treating people, but on uh, the control of misinformation, uh, disinformation, uh, controlling media. That's a lot. That really has a lot to do with what the pandemic exercise focused on. It was uh, control of information and media and um, 
uh, working around a vaccine skeptical population. Uh, switching to the phone to listen to it while I jog. Okay, cool, cool. Enjoy on your jog. All right, so we're going to, like I said, we're going to finish through this video and uh, then we're going to move on to some even worse videos. Which is checking your facts, making a follow up call <coughs> to see if 10% case fatality rate is actually a true thing that we should be talking about, using the right pictures. These are all things that somehow go right out the window when there's a brand new thing to be worried about. So, how does monkeypox spread? Well, I'll get my drawing tool out so we can share the same insights here at the same time. Hmm. It looks like monkeypox was likely spread by sex at two raves in Europe. Hmm. Uh, monkeypox outbreak was linked to... Uh, now, the whole thing about being spread at raves in Europe, that just has Wuhan wet market written all over it. It really does. Remember remember uh, COVID? They said, oh, yeah, the, wo the, the wet market spread it. Um, and then I think uh, the who said something about, like, you know, eating um, undercooked meat in all these wet markets. You know, they're very dirty places. It's a great place for viruses to jump from animals to humans. Um, in this case, we don't know too much about patient zero, but it's the story is that the patient was infected in Nigeria and then flew to, uh, I guess, either Spain or the Netherlands for one of their gay events there. Uh, and of course, June is Gay Pride Month, so already uh, we are seeing spread throughout the gay community, but people are using that as a way to kind of say like, oh, this is just a gay disease. You know, it's like HIV, but it's not. It's, it's just kind of the intro vector. Gay sauna and a festival. Um, looks like we're pretty clear now that mostly it was... Uh Monkeypox has spread a couple of raves. Okay, so there were two parties. Things got a little out of hand. There might have been some Molly floating around and, and some other uh, party drugs, and that's how it spreads so far. Does, is this something that looks like we need to emergency purchase $119 million and that we should do some fast-track authorization, some new vaccines, and that we need to start considering lockdowns again or we're going to have to do restrictions and things like that? Mm, nah, seems like there's an easier solution. Probably involves not having unprotected sex at raves. Maybe. I don't know. We could, we could just go there. Now, here's something that is of concern, though, and a lot of you sent this to me, and it, it's about this really awkward thing, which is November Event 201, which was a simulated coronavirus outbreak when there had never been a coronavirus outbreak like this in world history that happened in December of 2019, and there were all these players there that included ex, you know, mostly a lot of very high-level U.S. Oh, oh, he actually puts a link down here on the bottom. Okay, let's see if I can uh, t see that link. Do the study, nti.org. That's funny, they use WordPress, nti.org slash, uh, what is that, w, I can't be expected to remember all this, w, nti.org slash wp slash content slash uploads slash 2021 slash 11 slash nti underscore paper underscore bio slash ttx underscore banal punked pdf and see if the, we get this paper to come up here i don't know i just feel like if you have a big majorly trafficked website if you can hide the fact that you use wordpress you should because, you know, WordPress is kind of a well-understood framework, and it is very secure, but, you know, depending on what plugins you're using, it might not be. I just, I want to try this for kick, shit, uh, shits and giggles. I'm going to try and see if I can access WP, uh, let's see, login.php, just, just to see if they've blocked it, which they should, if they're, they should block it. Oh, no. Oh, no. Maybe they allow uh, random members of the public to log in. I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's not... Um... Go to the... Okay. Nuclear Threat Initiative. Oh, oh, is that what the NTI stands for? It stands for Nuclear Threat Initiative. Okay. But that's... Uh, maybe they have, like, a membership program or something. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, that's... Uh... If the public is not supposed to log in, then uh, you don't want them... Uh being able to access that login page. Uh, I don't see anything about letting people log in. That, uh, yeah, yeah, you should uh, you should block that there, NTI. Unless, you, unless people are allowed to log in. 
I don't know, maybe they've got uh, writers or third-party writers that need to come in here and upload their um, articles. Who knows? Yeah. Okay. So we've got the paper from NTI, Strengthening Global Systems to Prevent and Respond to High-Consequence Biological Threats. Results from the 2021 tabletop exercise conducted in partnership with the Munich, with the Munich Security Conference. Uh, summary, in March of 2021, NTI partnered with the Munich Security Conference to conduct a tabletop exercise on reducing high-consequence biological threats. The exercise examined gaps in national and international biosecurity and pandemic preparedness architectures, exploring opportunities to improve prevention and response capabilities for high-consequence biological events. This report summarizes uh, the exercise scenario, key findings from the discussion, and actionable recommendations for the international community. You know, it'd be one thing if they just wanted to improve our, um, our security against biological threats, but they, see, they seem to want to do it through... Uh, yeah, it was a, what is it? Uh, no captcha. Oh, they're behind Cloudflare. Cloudflare rate limits WordPress login. Oh, okay. I guess that's one way of doing it. I don't know. I feel like Cloudflare is the devil, but yeah, no, yeah, okay. Rate limiting. I guess assuming assuming they don't have the password and they're trying to like brute force their way in. Um, but most people probably aren't brute forcing their way in, honestly. Um, I mean, if somebody really wanted to get in there, they'd probably find some kind of exploit in the PHP code itself. Um, I've seen that before, where you uh, put in, like, random symbols or numbers in the URL request field, and it, like, gets you access to the MySQL. So, um, it's good. Rate limiting is good, but it's, like, it's not as good as just blocking the page to anyone who isn't supposed to be able to log in <coughs> but again you know maybe they got a situation where they can't do that all right continuing on government and also corporate interests there you had all the pharma companies you had media there you had you know cia x nsa sort of folks there plus the bill and melinda gates foundation and, and the davos crowd right so that was event 201 that happened magically in i think october or november of 2019 and then whoops this big coronavirus outbreak happened so now we have this thing which again was, is another simulated in, it's thought exercise, which is talking about another outbreak. So this is the thing that happened in November of 2021, strengthening global systems to prevent respond to high consequence biological threats. It was a war game simulation, and here's how it went. Um, this was conducted by the Nuclear Threat Initiative. So why NTI is doing this particular exercise is an interesting question. And really interestingly as well, that one of the three principal people here signing their names is Kevin P. Opre, uh, managing partner of the Palisades Group, which kind of oddly is an alternative asset manager in the global residential credit markets down here, um, managing in excess of 17.4 billion of loans and real estate since 2012. Uh, currently has a notional balance sheet of 5.1 billion in portfolio of residential loans and real estate. Huh. Why you would have a, a residential loan and real estate company as one of the principals in here, I think it's because Kevin was uh, the facilitator for this. Maybe he's a very, very good facilitator, I guess, but just kind of odd um, looking at that. I also like to know who's involved in these things. So let's look at the exercise really quickly. What was it? So in March, they conducted a tabletop exercise on reducing high consequence biological threats. This is a third in a series of collaborations between NTI and the Munich Security Conference. The exercise included 19 senior leaders and experts. We'll take a look at those in a second. What was the exercise scenario? Well. This was an exercise scenario portrayed a deadly global pandemic involving an unusual strain of monkeypox virus that first emerges in the fictional country of Brynia and eventually spreads globally. So, wow, what a coincidence. Um, now, difference being that this has an unusual strain because it turns out that this was manufactured in a lab. It had been tinkered by people and then released. And so they ran... How weird. How weird that uh, one of the highest case counts rights now is in uh, Britain and uh, the, uh, the pandemic... Uh, tabletop exercise centers around the fictional country of Brynia. Brynia, Britain, I don't know. Maybe they didn't try very hard. Sounds like corporate imagination to me. And through the whole exercise, and of course the exercise is to find out where are our weaknesses and strengths, what could we bolster, what can we learn from running a war game, you know, wh how could we have done better, where, where, how could we have controlled the flow of information, was there any new resources that ought to have been on hand, like, you know, the United States was caught despite spending billions on pandemic preparedness without even gloves and masks for healthcare workers uh, at the start of the pandemic. So a huge fail. So maybe they're just trying to find out where are the weaknesses. All right. But what a coincidence, right? That, well, you know, they run an exercise. It happens to be on monkeypox. Next thing you know, we're all whooped up about monkeypox. It's not a coincidence. The, the coincidence here is only that 
this relatively benign, easily managed outbreak of monkeypox is being whooped up into a national hysteria or even a global hysteria. But who are these expert contributors? I always like to know who's involved. Check this out. Appendix A, we look here. So in the pinkish colors, look at that Department of Homeland Security is here. Department of Health and Human Services is represented. Um, we have the U.S. Department of State represented a couple of times. We've got this company called Ginkgo Bioworks in here a couple of times. Obviously a bunch of, you know, a bunch of uh, technology people in here, Twist Biosciences, but we've got all our universities, Johns Hopkins. We've got Stanford, all of that. So these are the experts who are the contributors to this thing. And by the way, Ginkgo Biosciences, Bioworks there is an interesting company. They program cells. So this is a company that's actually involved in taking life forms, organisms, and changing their genetics. So using CRISPR technology or some other technologies like that, that biology by design. So I guess you'd want a company that's busy uh, monkeying around with, with life to figure out and tell you what would happen if people monkeyed around with life, I guess. Now, this is what's interesting to me, though. Who were the scenario players? These are the people in the room actually running the scenario. In green, we can see we've got Merck and Johnson & Johnson and Twist Bioscience, a lot of corporate interests here. In the pinkish colors, again, U.S. National Security Council. We've got Jeremy Farrar of the Wellcome Trust. Jeremy Farrar, of course, one of the people who was very instrumental meeting with Fauci early on in February, January, February 2020 to hide or cover up the lab leak hypothesis, pushing very hard for the natural natural zoonosis origin of COVID, of course, that, that gentleman right there. Um, we've got a former commissioner of the US FDA right there, US Food and Drug Administration, and we've got a WHO representative, so that's all the pink. Notice how right now, at least uh, in the start of this, they're saying, oh yeah, it's just, uh, it's monkeypox. It's been around since the 1950s or something. We, we understand it very well, you know? I just find that a little odd. Like these people keep thinking that we live in normal times. We don't live in normal times. But look who jumps out at me in yellow. Dr. Chris Elias of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Dr. George Gao from the Chinese equivalent of the CDC. Now, those two names jump out at me, of course, because those are two names from Event 201, which these are, these are, these, these are the people you call when you want to run a worldwide global pandemic simulation. And Event 201 didn't actually talk about surprisingly or not, how to actually save lives. It talked about how important it was to control information and stop the spread of misinformation and that you couldn't have anything but the official sources of information being trusted because that would lead to all sorts of bad outcomes. And of course, you wanted to talk about how you're going to get to rapid vaccine adoption by a potentially skeptical public. So those are the players in Event 201. And of course, they're the same people you're going to call over for your monkeypox simulation. So th that's just a lot of coincidences right there. I I'm really, I just wish these people would stop messing around with vaccines and viruses and all of that and trying to create vaccines to viruses that haven't actually even hit yet. It just, it just doesn't smell right. I, I just really wish they'd stop. I wish that we as humans would go, look, the whole prospect of viruses and how they actually operate is a combinatorial, mathematical, biological, complex problem that is so beyond our ability to control that maybe we ought to stop messing around with these things and attempting to create new vaccine viruses so that we can learn from them. Because what we've learned is they tend to get away from us and they tend to escape and then they're going to do what they do once they get out. So we really ought not to be. Full stop. We should not be messing around with viruses to try and create more deadly versions of them so that we can learn. Yeah, you know what we learn? Humans are humans. No matter how infallible you think your system is, it's fallible. These viruses are going to virus. They're going to escape. That's what happens. Or they're going to be let go by somebody at some point for some other reason. So maybe we shouldn't have them in the first place to either escape or be released. Just an idea. All right. So, um, but I want to contrast all of that hoopla that's happening around monkeypox and oh my gosh and it's a health emergency and you might get it if you eat meat and it's all this all this crazy fear porn around it meanwhile this went right down the memory hole remember this so this is actually a real thing that's really very concerning imagine if monkey pox virus had caused six children to die so far or had caused toddlers to have to undergo these liver transplants or that it was actually still spreading and moving all over the place so what is going on with this this is the this is there's a form of hepatitis in children that's been linked to adenoviruses and we really need to know what's going on with that and somehow that's gone right down the memory hole. And I'm over here thinking, I need to see the sequence data from that virus right away. Now, when Omicron came out within 24 hours, I had sequence data on it. And I could look at it and say, oh, this thing did not evolve from the earlier variants. This thing came from somewhere else. That was very easy to determine. And we had that data in astonishingly fast time. We already have 20 separate fully sequenced monkeypox viruses. And so I'm able to look at that and go, oh, did not come from a lab. I want to know what's going on with this. Where, where is the sequence data? So I, I'm tracking always the sins of omission and commission. A sin of commission is easy. That's a lie. It's a lie that you've been told by the press or an official source. A sin of omission is when suddenly there's a vacuum, uh, an absence of story there. There's, there. You know there should be some information there and you can't find it. It's just missing. So a sin of omission are things you don't talk about that you really should. So CBS Mornings has this uh, boring dystopia, feel good, their feel-good story. The Schwab family was facing life or death when their two-year-old Balin was suffering from severe hepatitis. After an eight-hour surgery and a new liver, she gets another chance at life maybe she shouldn't have got the hepatitis in the first place and we should know like why did this happen so check this out this is interesting to me the most recent technical briefing i have from the uk security agency health security agency they say here while preliminary typing of the adenovirus associated with this hepatitis has been consistent with type 41f where data is available they would recommend that whole genome sequencing from multiple cases is essential before characterization of the virus can be confirmed 
this is in process, although the low level of adenovirus present in blood means the data quality has been challenging. So they're trying. They're just like they don't have enough of the adenovirus to really work with is what they're saying. But I would agree with them. Whole genome sequencing for multiple cases. Like we have those 20 pox viruses fully sequenced now. We need whole genome sequencing for multiple cases. Then we can tell you something. Because we really need to know, has something happened to this type 41F adenovirus? Has it picked up some new genetic sequence from somewhere that would now be causing it to be more deadly? This would be critical information to know. So where's the sequence, right? And continuing, look, the WHO even says they recommend... Ah, uh, let's type out that uh, link there. Let's take a look at that one. Let's see. Assets publishing.service.gov uk slash government slash uploads slash system uploads attachment underscore data slash files slash 1071198 slash acute hepatitis technical briefing one underscore four underscore dot pdf so there's actually uh, maybe there's a couple pandemics that are going on around right now i don't know really hope not but Woo. Further virus characterization, including sequencing for this hepatitis adenovirus. Absolutely. So where is it? Where is that data? Well, we don't have it. And that's a sin of omission. We need to have that data. All right. Conclusions for episode 62 here on Monkeypox. First, don't worry about it. Monkey, don't worry about the monkeypox. Worry about the fear porn and the official reactions. But monkeypox itself, as it stands right now, it's not a significant public health concern because at this time the r naught is below one. So it's going to die out all on its own. It does not transmit easily between people. The vaccines that we do have work pretty well against it, and so high-risk people can be protected if necessary. That could be healthcare workers or other people who may be in a frontline position where they have to be protected because they really don't want to get the monkeypox. And by the way, there are no signs at this time that this has been manipulated in a laboratory. So that's a good sign, because when we manipulate these things in the laboratory, who knows what the downstream effects are going to be. But this is a wild-type virus. We have 30, 40 years of experience with it. We know what to do. To avoid it, mainly, just don't have sex with people with rashes and skin lesions. Come on. That seems like a no-brainer. That shouldn't be that hard. To the fear porn, however, by the press, it tells me yet again that they do not deserve to be in business or in my living room or in your living room. None whatsoever. To say even for a minute that this monkeypox has a case fatality rate of 10% is incredibly irresponsible. If I ever did anything like that, I'd be called to the carpet. I'd probably be deplatformed right away, rightly so. However, when it's the larger media that does that, they get to do it over and over and over again. And guess what happens? Nothing. They just do it over and over again. It's time for us to recognize that that fear, when I opened this whole thing, I said, we, do not have, we don't have to fear monkeypox. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself, right? So that's the old Roosevelt uh, saying. So... That fear itself, though, is a mind killer, and it's a body killer. People who are living under constant fear have reduced immune systems. So maybe the fear about monkeypox is actually creating the conditions where monkeypox can spread because we have immune-compromised people, or there's some other immune compromisation going on across our population that's allowing it a more easy foothold in the human population at this point in time. All right, so uh, remember, the sin of omission is about as telling as the sin of commission and always is. What's not discussed is always as important as the lies themselves. You need to track both those things. That's what I do as an information scout for the world is I'm always tracking what's out there being talked about and is that appropriate, but what's not being talked about. Now, in part two of this report, I, there's some really, the, one of the biggest things I've ever seen that we're not talking about, a little bit, but it's not being talked about, is actually one of the biggest risks I know about out there to your health, your well-being, your economic future. It's huge. And I have to talk about it more because, well, nobody else is, or very few people are. So, really, really big. And finally, in conclusion here, I really wish they would stop running simulations and somehow turn into the next current thing. Just please, just, just stop. I'm a, I, I'm a coincidence theorist. I hate coincidences. Remember, once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, but three times is enemy action. So, the number of times that these simulations end up turning into real-world situations is astonishing to me. Monkeypox. So, the simulation for monkeypox, it showed a laboratory-manipulated monkeypox. We don't have that. So that part of the simulation didn't come true, but I'll guarantee you that with all those players and, and the way they think and all those government and corporate and other interested players in that room, because of how they are, are built, that when monkeypox came out, there was a machine that was ready to amplify that and turn it into a, an area of concern for a lot of people, which means they, they, in this story, are spreading the fear porn to you. 
and they get something out of that, which is, I don't know, future funding for future simulations, uh, more, more departmental money for whatever department they're running, uh, more investor interest in their corporate products and things like that. I understand the motivations in this game. Remember, if you show me the incentive, I will show you the outcome. The incentives are always for people in power to accumulate more power, and one of the ways they do that is by amplifying the message of fear. There is nothing, nothing in the monkeypox data, not in terms of raw numbers, not in terms of how it's spreading, not in terms of how fast it's spreading, not in terms of its actual lethality that deserves anything close to a fraction of the overall attention it's gotten so far. Where did that attention come from? Well, it came from a system that just got a lot of power and a lot of money over doing the same sort of a routine of fear injection around COVID itself. So, monkeypox, don't worry about it. But do note the, the level of um, attention and real estate it's, that they're attempting to occupy in your brain space around monkeypox. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. However, there is something else that is a big deal, and that is going to be this part right here. This is the most important warning sign I've ever seen. I've been spending ah, the past 12, 15 years, I forget how long it's been now, talking about energy and energy situations and what's going on in the world from an energy standpoint. If you're in Europe in particular, you're about to get absolutely crushed by what's coming. All right, so he's moving on to part two of his, of his talk. All right, so now let's see. What part do we want to watch here? Uh, I think, oh yeah, let's go ahead and go into, so we all know Dr. Robert Malone. He's thankfully been covering the monkeypox pandemic, and uh, he's got a little something for us here to read. So let's go ahead, and we're going to dive now into Robert Malone. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and read his, uh, his latest Substack update. Monkeypox update for May 31st, 2022. There has been a significant development. Will the blatant fear porn ever stop? The controlled media have no shame. If Ronald Reagan were still, were still with us, I suspect we would be hearing, there you go again, replays. First came the coordinated media blast of public health-related fear porn. For example, the image of from Jake Tapper's CNN broadcast program, the lead of May 20. 2022 above which appears to me to be a case of smallpox not monkeypox another example involves the self-explanatory parrot image below uh yeah the image below where they uh have healthsite.com talking about rare monkeypox cases and they are using a stock photo which has also been used by the queensland government queensland health uh, department for example of shingles because that's probably what the stock photo is actually of. It's actually of shingles. Um, I mean, on the one hand, I don't blame them for not wanting to use like an actual patient photo. Um, it's probably easier to use a stock photo because that's all they have. And of course, the Bill and Melinda Gates funded Gavi, uh, Gavi text, which is quite blatant, claiming 10% mortality, which I covered in a prior sub Substack article concerning monkeypox and fear porn. I almost cannot believe that I am writing this, but since my original Substack article on this topic, we have reveal of an event 201 style war game exercise. Let's see, what's he referring to? Can we? Let me click on his source here. Okay. Modeled around bioterror related release of an engineered monkeypox virus caused by a terrorist attack, terrorist attack using a pathogen engineered in a laboratory with inadequate biosafety and biosecurity provisions and weak oversight. Oh, no, doesn't that sound familiar? Right? That sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? With amazing coincidental pre prescience, the tabletop exercise of March 2021, one year and three months into the COVID crisis, models a monkeypox bioterror attack initiated on May 15th, 2022. Note the date of the CNN Jake Tapper fear porn piece, May 20th, 2022. The modeling de deployed in the scenario upon which the exercise was based predicts 3.2 billion cases and 271 million deaths by December 1st of 2023. Of course, the predictive accuracy of the simplistic public health models, such as that used to support this scenario, have repeatedly proven to be absolutely horrid. These types of models should be either relegated to the trash heap or ongoing dumpster fire as unscientific speculation, which is all too frequently weaponized by the fear porn peddlers such as CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Washington Post, but now we all know the usual USG and 
WEF controlled media players. As the Italians like to say, nothing happens by chance. As we know, as we now know, the amazing foresight of this model date immediately precedes a seminal WHO meeting, which has just concluded, in which international health regulation, IHR, modifications, which would grant the WHO unprecedented powers to bypass national constitutions proposed on January 23rd, 2022 by the U.S. Uh, health and Homeland Services, were actively considered but tabled for a future meeting. November of 2022, perhaps, largely due to African nation concerns regarding infringement of national sovereignty. The stated purpose of the exercise was remarkably well aligned with the stated objectives and topics proposed by U.S. Health and Homeland Services in the submitted IHR mod uh, modifications. To establish a new global biosecurity entity dedicated to reducing emerging biological risks that can accompany certain technological advances, its mission will be to reduce the risk of catastrophic consequences due to accidents, inadvertent misuses, or deliberate abuses of bioscience and biotechnology by promoting stronger global biosecurity norms and developing tools and incentives to uphold them. To explore the possibility of establishing a new joint assessment mechanism to investigate high-consequence biological events of unknown origin, this new mechanism would operate at the seam between existing mechanisms, including World Health Organization outbreak investigation capabilities and the United Nations Secretary General's mechanism for investigating alleged deliberate bioweapon use, thereby strengthening UN system capabilities to investigate pandemic origins. To advocate for establishing a catalyst, a catalyst, a catalytic multilateral financing mechanism for global health security and pandemic preparedness. The goal is to accelerate sustainable biosecurity and pandemic preparedness capacity building in country in countries where resources are most needed. And here we have a picture of Curiouser and Curiouser, a little picture of, I believe this is Alice in Wonderland peeking behind the curtain. So do we have yet another example of a pandemic? All I can say is, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Sir Walter Scott, Merriamun. Or perhaps the more appropriate quote would be, the Italians have a proverb, he that deceives me once, it's his fault, but if twice, it's my fault. Anthony Weldon, the court and character of King James, 1651. In my prior substack entitled Monkeypox, Truth vs. Fear Porn, I concluded the essay with the following caveat. Unless there has been some genetic alteration, either through evolution or intentional genetic manipulation, it is not a significant bile threat, has never been considered a high threat pathogen in the past. Which brings us to this May 20. Third, 2022 report from the Portuguese Nat National Institute of Health. Ooh, dear. Ooh, dear. And it reads here in the photo, multi-country outbreak of monkeypox monkey virus, genetic divergence, and first signs of microevolution. Just to set the stage, the outbreak seems to be tightly associated with a point of origin at what appear to have been two large European dance party events, raves. Uh, that's, a, that's a very family-friendly and safe way of putting it. In the Canary Islands, gay pride event in the Canary Islands, which drew some 80,000 people, and a Madrid sauna. Oh yeah, there's a sauna in Madrid. Uh, there's a couple events, actually. Um, Canary Islands event was the 20th anniversary of Masopalomo. Uh, Palomas, Massal Palomas, Mass Palomas, Gay Pride, which took place from May 5th to May 15th, the precise date of the previously modeled monkeypox bioweapon release. The organizers anticipated a huge parade with over 100,000 participants, boat trips, pool parties, and more. And more, right, yeah. So basically, pretty much a perfectly a perfect opportunity for a monkeypox super spreader event, whether intent uh, whether intentional or inadvertent. Donning my cynical skeptic tinfoil hat for a moment, if one was looking for an opportunity to seek a pathogen into a 
uh, into a highly mobile international population, mindful of the early history of HIV-based AIDS, this would be just what the Dr. Er Mengele ordered. Multiple cases were soon detected in Portugal, and to their great credit, INSA Portugal got busy and promptly did the deep sequencing necessary to enable building a phylogenetic map of the monkeypox variant associated with the outbreak. Based on their findings, they have rapidly disclosed both their data as well as a series of startling hypotheses regarding the origin of the currently circulating monkeypox, West African clade monkeypox. Uh, cutting to the chase, having reviewed their data and paper, I now have to conclude that one of the many working hypotheses concerning the origin of this particular virus must be that it is the product of laboratory-based manipulation, precisely as previously modeled by the Nuclear Threat Initiative NTI Bio Munich Security Conference. True story, truth continues to be stranger than fiction. The author briefly and elegantly summarizes the study purpose and methods as follows. Following the first draft genome sequence of monkeypox virus associated with the suspected multi-country outbreak, May 2022 confirmed case in Portugal, 184. He now released nine additional genome sequences of monkeypox virus causing a multi-country outbreak. These sequences were obtained from clinical specimens collected from nine patients on May 15th and 17th, 2022 through high uh, through throughput short shotgun met, metagenomics using Illumina technology. See details below with depth of coverage throughout monkeypox genome ranging from 38 magnification to 508 uh, magnification mean of the 201st. The rapid integration of the newly sequenced genomes into the monkeypox genetic diversity, also including the sequence released by USA. Gigantic and, and others, uh, Giganti and others, monkeypox virus isolate MPXV USA 2022 MA001 complete genome nucleotide and CBI 156. They then proceed to raise the following main observations. The multi country outbreak most likely has a single origin, with all sequenced vir viruses released so far tightly clustering together. Confer confirmation of the phylogenetic placement unveiled by the first draft sequence is a draw and others 183. The outbreak virus belongs to the West African clade and is most closely related to viruses based on available genome data associated with the exportation of monkeypox virus from Nigeria to several countries in 2008 and 2019, namely the United Kingdom, Israel, and Singapore. Still, the outbreak virus diverges a mean of 50 SNPs from those 2018-2019 viruses, 46 SNPs uh, from the closest reference, MPXV, UK Part 2, MT9033441.1, Table 1, which is far more than one would expect considering the estimated substitution rate for orthopox viruses. As also mentioned by Rambau, by Rambau, discussion of ongoing MPXV genome sequencing 228, one cannot discard the hypothesis the divergent branch results from an evolutionary jump leading to a hypermutated virus caused by APOBEC3 editing. Uh, keep that in mind. That sequence is important. We have already detected the first signs of microevolution within the outbreak cluster, namely the emergence of seven SNPs, table two, leading to three descendant branches, including a further subcluster supported by two SNPs involving two sequences. Notably, these two sequences also share a nine. 113 BP frame shift deletion in MPXV UK P2010 gene coding for an acarin host range protein. Gene loss events were already observed in the context endemic monkeypox circulation in Central Africa, being hypothesized to correlate with human to human transmission. Those not versed in academia and academic science talk 
may be shaking their heads by this point and probably getting ready to post a comment along the lines of why don't you just tell us what this means in simple language. So, at the risk of oversimplification, looks like the monkeypox outbreak comes from a single original virus source, following the teachings of the multiple working hypothesis model for arriving at a scientific truth, which was a core part of my education as a young scientist. A, this could be, for example, a natural single jump event from some infected animal into a single human somewhere in the world, presumably had some relationship to the mass Palomas gay pride event, or B, it could have come from an intentional release of a viral isolate mixed news could be good or bad. The authors have confirmed that this new outbreak virus maps to the less disease-causing West African group clad of monkeypox viruses. Good news. This single source virus could have come from West Africa or could have come from United Kingdom, Israel, or Singapore. Consistent with either hypothesis A or B, mixed news could be good or bad. Despite the sequences indicating that the virus is most closely related to uh, those isolated in 2018 and 2019, it is significantly different. This could be due to natural evolution or due to laboratory engineering gain of function research, consistent with hypothesis A and B. Generally bad news. Basically, the authors are indicating that they believe that genome of this, vi the, that genome of this virus is either evolving more rapidly than one would expect from a double-stranded DNA pox virus left unsaid or somebody has been messing around with it, the authors speculate that the pattern of mutations are consistent with the effects of a natural cellular protein with the abbreviated name of APOBEC3. For those who want to dive into molecular virology, APOBEC3, here is a nice 2015 uh, J immunology review. For those seeking the Cliff Notes abridged version, see Wikipedia. For the obsessives and aficionados, note that APOBEC3 is associated with specific pattern of base changes, E to U. On the basis of their hypothesis regarding the potential role of APOBEC3, I infer that the authors must have detected a statistically significant fraction of C to U changes and the current isolate relative to the 2018-2019 isolates. Mixed news could be good or bad, still does not differentiate between hypothesis A or hypothesis B. Here is the rub. While APOBEC3 is associated with cellular resistance, yet another form of innate immunity, it isn't, isn't molecular vi virology and cell biology amazing. Here's the rub. While APOBEC3 is associated with cellular resistance to HIV and presumably other retroviruses, a quick PubMed search reveals that pox viruses are resistant to the mutational effects of APOBEC3. For example, see this 2006 paper published in Virology. Frankly, whether through lack of curiosity or fear of attack from government-controlled media and journalists, the failure of the authors to even mention this virology article is a major oversight at best. My inference and interpre interpre interpretation on the basis of this sequence analysis report from the INSA team cited above, to me, this is looking more like a laboratory manipulated strain than a naturally evolved strain. Bad news. Furthermore, this double-stranded DNA virus, infections by which have historically been self-limiting, appears to be evolving during the last few days to a form that is more readily transmitted from human to human. Bad news. In conclusion, the preponderance of current evidence is pointing towards a hypothesis for the origin of this outbreak, which is increasingly consistent with prior war game scenario planning, remarkably akin to that which occurred during event 201, which posits emergence of an engineered monkeypox virus into the human population during mid-May of 2022. Draw your own conclusions and do your own diligence. In related news, World Health Organization using monkeypox to justify human rights violations with experimental vaccines, World Council for Health. 
link here. One day after the close of the Ma Mass Palomas Gay Pride Super Spreader event, link here, Emergent boosts counter emergent boosts countermeasures repertoire with three hundred and twenty five million dollar deal for smallpox newcomer Tembexa. Emergent Biosolutions already flush with products against public health threats like anthrax attacks and opioid overdose and opioid overdo overdoses. No, that's a tongue twister. Opioid overdoses is expanding its arsenal of medical countermeasures by scooping up global rights to smallpox newcomer Tembexa. Emergent will finish furnish developer Chimerix with $225 million in upfront cash plus upward of $100 million in milestone payments for worldwide rights. Emergent Biosolutions already flush with products against public health threats like anthrax attacks and opiate overdoses it is expanding its arsenal of medical countermeasures by scooping up global rights to smallpox newcomer Tembexa. Woo! Emergent will furnish developer Amerix with $225 million in upfront cash plus upward of $100 million in milestone payments for worldwide rights. Woo! That is a lot. That is absolutely a lot. Um, yeah, okay, so that's, that's one of the biggest updates. That is one of the biggest updates. I hope, I hope you guys were here for that. Uh, let me check here and see. Hey, uh, see if there's anybody watching here. Let's see, we got, uh, I think we got one watching maybe over, no, I don't think anybody's watching on Entropy. But we do have, um, we do have, I think, six or so people. Yeah, about six people on uh, Odyssey. So shout out to you guys. And uh, let's see, do I have anybody uh, watching anywhere else? Nope. Okay. So yeah, D Live and Odyssey are the, or D Live and okay. yeah. Odyssey and Entropy are the main ones. All right. So, I hope you guys were able to take in all of that. So basically what they're saying is, this virus has about 50 SNPs, I don't know what those are, in a particular section, the APOBEC3 section, which it's normally resistant to mutations in. And the other thing you got to understand is this is a D night virus, right? So Omicron or um, COVID was RNA based, right? A single strand of, of genetic material. So when it copies itself over, if it makes a mistake, it basically just, you know, if it makes a mistake, it makes a mistake. And for all the mistakes it makes, that's just basically a new va variant. And most variants are probably not variants of concern because they're not significantly different enough, but you know, you do that enough times, eventually you get one of concern. So anyway, um, it sounds like this DNA virus, right? DNA double-stranded he uh, helix. Basically, as it replicates, it has error correction built into it as it replicates, which is why it doesn't mutate that often. It's, it's rare for it to mutate, especially to mutate a lot, because it has built-in error correction, because it's got the two helix strands that it can basically do... Um, copy protection or yeah what whatever air correction from but for some reason not only did this one mutate significantly in an area that is very highly resistant against mutations in it appears to be continuing to mutate at a rate that is much too quick for a dna based orthopox virus so that's that's what's happening right so we're already getting different variants of this uh, monkeypox virus than, uh, than what we should be seeing. Odyssey hype, whoop, whoop. So yeah, we are uh, seeing, definitely, we are seeing some, now, uh, I know that, um, I know that Chris Martinson talked a little earlier about a mysterious hepatitis outbreak that is affecting children uh, which I believe is coming from an adenovirus, which is interesting to me because I believe Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca used an adenovirus vector 
for their vaccine. Um, what could that mean? But, you know, who knows? Who knows? I'm going to leave you with this next video, which is quite disturbing as well. The National Institute of Health from the United States and Wuhan were doing experiments on monkeypox. As of, I guess, 2019 and 2020, uh, I'm assuming, I believe, or 2021. Yeah. Yeah. So now we've already read a paper that says, wow, we've seen significant mutations in this, in this monkeypox virus, and we're getting, uh, we're getting variants of concern, al or variants already, much quicker than we should. And uh, we've already got the, uh, uh, the global uh, tabletop exercise from 2021 from the World Health Organization, and now we find out that the Wuhan Institute of Virology experimenting on, mon on monkeypox and see this is all coming together all coming together it's just all coming together now well you're most welcome to today's talk tuesday the 31st of may now the main thing we're looking at today is it turns out that the national institutes of health in the united states and the wuhan institute of virology have both been working on monkeypox coincidentally uh, before the outbreak that we are currently uh, experiencing so rather strange now we're not going to be talking about the involvement of the nih in uh, sars coronavirus 2 and uh, gain of possible gain of function research we're not going to be talking about the wuhan institute of virology uh, and the fact that it coincidentally is only 14 miles from the wet market where the uh, covid 19 pandemic uh, allegedly started we're not going to be talking about the world health organization's frankly embarrassing farcical uh, I, I don't like to use the term investigation into the origins of this virus. We're just going to stick to the facts about monkeypox, not COVID-19, not sars coronavirus 2 although you may draw some parallels. Now, let's start off by looking at uh, where we are at the moment with uh, monkeypox. So this is monkeypox, cumulative world cases. Now, the cases aren't high. The actual cases will be much higher than the diagnosed cases, of course. So this is only the cases, not the infections. But it is a steep uh, increase in cases no question about that and when we look at the countries that are involved here um, we actually see that there's quite a widespread of countries and um, the United Kingdom is certainly uh, forging ahead which is a little surprising because the epicenters of this European outbreak seem to be in Spain and uh, Belgium and yet it's the UK that's got most cases is it just that the UK is diagnosing uh, more efficiently than other countries that, that may transpire in the future we don't know that it may or may not be true but we see the United Kingdom with the highest number of cases. And then we see uh, Spain, Portugal, and going down, we see Germany, Netherlands, sorry, Canada, Netherlands, Germany, France, United States, Italy, Belgium, with small numbers of cases. But we are seeing a widespread of cases throughout the world. And when we look at the map uh, here, just to give us the international context of this, um, we do see the cases are in Europe and North America. Argentina there, I didn't know, know about Argentina, Australia, a small number, but uh, actually Nigeria, um, where this is uh, endemic, and uh, that's Congo there, I'm pretty sure that's Congo, yeah, that's Congo there, I'm pretty sure. Um, no cases uh, identified, uh, no, not, not because there aren't any, but because they haven't been, um, they haven't been diagnosed there. there. There will be some there, because there always are, uh, to some extent, uh, cases there. Now, let's move on to what we know. Now, the first report comes from this, from the National Institutes of Health. Um, so um, this is about uh, a randomized placebo controlled trial on the safety and efficacy of uh, tecovirimat, an antiviral treatment for the treatment of patients with monkeypox. So good that the National Institute of Health uh, is uh, researching this and seem to have anticipated the possibility of this current outbreak of monkeypox. Um, now, let's look at this in a little detail. So th that's the our, wor our World in Data, which is now starting to track this. Um, now, the uh, Monkeypox Treatment Research Project, total funding is the best part of $10 million. That's a lot of money. The funding supports a clinical trial to identify effective treatment for monkeypox, well-anticipated NIH. Uh, it's a re-emerging pathogen. That's true. Uh, it's a disease of uh, endemic potential. Now, this is true and concerning. Now, what concerns me at mon about monkeypox at the moment is not so much that there's a few cases, although that is concerning, of course, but that this could get into animals. It could get into cats, hamsters, rodents, mice, rats, squirrels in Europe, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, 
and become endemic. That means we would have repeated, okay, maybe small outbreaks, but repeated outbreaks basically indefinitely. It could become endemic here in Europe and the United States as it is in Africa. This is perhaps the, the main concern. And, and the other thing that is concerning is that this is in the same group of diseases as smallpox. Now, I'm not comparing it with smallpox. It's not as contagious. It's not as deadly. It's not as pathogenic. But it is in the same group of uh, viruses as smallpox. Um, this is all from the National Institutes of Health. It can cause significant morbidity and can result in death. Talking about smallpox, that's straight from the NIH. Human cases have been increasing in sub-Saharan Africa since 2000. Sporadic outbreaks outside of Africa have, have occurred. And the similarity, the similarity between the monkeypox virus and the variola virus, which of course is the virus that causes smallpox, still from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, they say, coupled with concerns about the potential of the variola smallpox virus as a potential bio terrorism target so perhaps the NIH anticipated this outbreak uh, perhaps they anticipated the possibility that uh, smallpox could once again be used as a biological not once again but be used as a biological warfare agent well you actually could say used again because it has been used as a as a biological warfare agent uh, in the past uh, albeit at the level of spreading a uh, plague blanket blankets to uh, indigenous peoples in America or catapulting corpses into besieged cities in the past. Um, but this potential for bioterrorism now, of course, is much more sophisticated. Um, so have placed monkeypox treatment at the forefront of public health and science research agenda in many countries. So if they could find a good cure for monkeypox, the idea is that that would work for smallpox as well, which is a good thing to do. So. That looks like the National Institutes of Health have been working on that actually for some time. This research project is running from uh, the 20th of September, 20th of September 2020 uh, through to the 27th of September 2025. So we don't expect results on that at any time soon, but it, interesting. Now, this next bit is an article from here. And uh, I kid you not, this is, the Institute, this is from the Institute of Virology in Wuhan. This is where this research on monkeypox is being carried out. So let's look at this. Uh, let's look at this in a little more detail. Now, this is an article in uh, Virologica Sinica, which we'll look at uh, in a minute. That's the article there. There it is. Download the PDF. It is a full uh, peer reviewed article in this uh, official Chinese um, publication. Now, let's look at what they're doing. What, what they're doing basically is they are working and this was published in February 2022. So the Wuhan Institute of Virology is working on a test to test for the presence of monkeypox. And I think we could assume they're interested in tests for smallpox as well. Bearing in mind this is a potential biological warfare agent. If you're already starting to feel uncomfortable, join the club. I'm actually very uncomfortable about what I'm about to tell you. So that's the name of the paper there. Efficiency of a large scale fragment of monkeypox virus. So basically what they're doing is they make a section of monkeypox virus uh, and they want to use that as a quantitative polymerase chain reaction template uh, and they're going to use this way to put it together into, into a yeast. Now, a direct quote from this paper. Since monkeypox infection has never been associated with an outbreak in China, the viral genome material required for PCR detection is unavailable. So the Chinese authorities, it would appear, are incapable of getting hold of... Um, monkeypox virus so they have to basically make their own using synthetic uh, techniques or make a part of the viral genome themselves using synthetic uh, techniques so the monkeypox virus is available readily in labs in nigeria congo the united kingdom um, presumably now in the united states several places in europe and the virus is available from anyone who has symptomatic monkeypox anyone who's got a pustule with monkeypox just take a scraping and there you've got the virus so the idea that the chinese authorities can't get a sample of the actual virus and have to synthesize their own i'm not buying it i'm not buying it all they need to do is send some people to nigeria slip the nigerians a few dollars and i'm sure they'd come back with a vial of monkeypox uh, virus but apparently they can't do that why on earth would they publish that it is so obviously uh, incredulous uh, say, saying that it's not available in china so they've got to make their own don't buy it do not buy that at all. You can make your own mind up, of course, but I'm giving that a red cross. I'm not buying that one, I'm afraid. It's available. The virus is available. 
especially to somewhere like the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So anyway, because it's not available, they're forced to make their own poor things using viral DNA recombinations. And this technique here, transformed associated recombination, where they put the uh, part of the viral genome together to assemble large DNA constructs. So they're actually assembling. So obviously they know the, they know the um, gene sequence in the monkeypox virus. So they are synthesizing that basically from scratch, basically from scratch, putting the, uh, the DNA basis together and then they put it into a yeast to multiply it up so you can make any amount of it. And then you can use that yeast to test the, the veracity of your uh, Q uh, quantitative preliminary chain reaction tests for monkeypox. That is what they are uh, suggesting here. And they're made of 55,000, uh, so it's 55,000, uh, 55 kilobyte, 55,000 uh, bits of the um, monkeypox viral genome. And then they put it into this. Now, this VL648B is a standard available commercially available yeast cells so basically it means you can brew it up like beer once it's in yeast cells once you've got yeast cells you just basically put them in water with a bit of sugar and they'll brew up as many as you want basically that's that's the case um, so you can make up huge amounts of it now um what is virologica sinica uh, here it is now this is the information about that it, it is readily available um and i'll tell you a little bit about what it is from this website it's the official journal of the chinese uh, society of microbiology and it will serve as a platform for the communication and exchange of academic information and ideas in an international context. Sounds pretty good. Uh, now, let me just show you something here. Th 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 this, is, um, this is direct from this paper, because this is the bit that's really quite chilling. Um, here it is. This, is. this work was carried out, <laughs> just in case you think I'm making this up. At the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, th this is one of the reasons that it's so uncomfortable what, what i'm uh, telling you stroke terrifying discussion section right, of this paper right so actually in this paper itself it exactly says, exactly yeah bill gates was warning about this last year in november he was like oh you guys it's gonna be a smallpox outbreak everybody right let's read this article really quick you know watch bill gates warns of bioterrorist smallpox pandemic Bill Gates has warned gov that governments must prepare for future pandemics and smallpox terror attacks by investing billions in research and development. Mr. Gates has made the warning during a policy exchange interview with the chair of the Health Select Com Committee, Jeremy Hunt. The Microsoft founder also called for the formation of a new billion-dollar World Health Organization pandemic task force. Right, yeah. A dream team thing. While the research may be expensive, he said, that it could also lead to other innovations, such as eradicating flu and the common cold. He said that countries like the U.S. and the U.K. must spend tens of billions to fund the research. I'm hoping in five years I can write a book called We, Why, or we Are Ready for the Next Pandemic, but it'll take tens of billions in R&D, and the U.S. and the U.K. will be part of that, he said. It'll take probably about a billion a year for a pandemic task force at the WHO level, which is doing surveillance and actually doing what I call germ games where you practice. Mr. Gates suggested that the germ games, uh, the germ games, oh uh, yeah, that they just finished at that time probably. Mr. Gates suggested that the germ games could include preparing for acts of bioterrorism such as smallpox attacks on airports. Uh, you say, okay, what if a bioterrorist brought smallpox to 10 airports? You know, how would the world respond to that? There's naturally caused epidemics and bioterrorism caused epidemics that could be even be way worse than what we experience today. He said, there's naturally, there's naturally caused epidemics and bioterrorism caused epidemics that could be even way worse than what we experience today. Well, that's a quote from the picture. Uh, despite the dire warning, the world's fourth richest man also struck an optimistic note during the interview, anticipating the incredibly beneficial medical innovations that will come from increased funding for pandemic prevention. The nice thing is a lot of the R&D we, uh, we need to do to be ready for the next pandemic are things like making vaccines cheap, having big factories, eradicating the flu, getting rid of common cold, making vaccines just a little patch you put on your arm. Oh yeah, just a little patch on your arm. Every, every couple of years, it's going to be a new disease that's come out. You're going to just going to get a little patch on your arm. Experimental patch that has only been tested by the company that developed it. 
uh, it was just a little patch you put on your arm, things that will be incredibly beneficial even in the years when we don't have pandemics, he said. Really, even in the years when we don't have pandemics, there'll still be, you still need to put the patch on your arm, oh, we'll still need to give you the thouchy ouchy. He added that he will continue to talk about pandemic preparedness as part of his work as a philanthropist. Oh, he's just, he cares about people so much. He said, so long with the climate message and ongoing fight against disease of the poor, pandemic preparedness is something I'll be, t I'll be t talking about a lot. Oh, well, that's an interesting wording. So long, so along with the climate change message, along with the climate change message and the ongoing fight against diseases of the poor, pandemic preparedness is something I'll be talking about a lot. Isn't that, isn't that kind of how he talks? And I think it'll, it'll find fertile ground because, you know, we lost trillions of dollars and millions of lives, and citizens expect their governments not to let that happen again. Except that it appears that that is exactly what is happening again, because, uh, uh, who, uh, who, gay pride, who is saying that there's no need to change gay pride events. Uh, Pride Month, yeah, 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 yeah. Who said, uh, who says continue gay pride events? Right? Yeah, there we go. The Hill. Pride parades should go on despite monkeypox concerns. That's why. Dude, this is so weird because it's just playing out exactly like COVID, right? With COVID, right, it was the Chinese that were the kind of the scapegoat. Oh, it's the Chinese, it's the Chinese. But now it's the gays, the gays, the gays, right? And they're like, oh, don't let fear of coronavirus impede your Chinese New Year's celebrations. And now they're like, oh, don't let fear of monkeypox impede your anal scrunching celebrations. Hmm. Hmm. Like a fun, a germ game sounds like a fun Olympic event. Trust the science, K. Trust the science. The science. Trust the science. Monkeypox understands that gay pride is more important right now. Yes. Yes. Exactly. This, however, this DNA assembly tool, putting together the viral DNA, Remember, this is the instruction to make the viral proteins, the monkeypox. And by the way, if you could make a monkeypox virus, I'm sure you can make any other viruses you want. For example, um, I'm just thinking a random one, smallpox. Um, but smallpox is, is, is already saved already. We know that the original strains of smallpox are, are, are saved already. But whether they're saved... I mean, it'd be hard for them to release smallpox and then try and say it's a natural outbreak. I mean, if smallpox ever appeared up anywhere, we'd know... Like, immediately that it was lab released. Ready or not really doesn't matter anymore because they can now be synthesized. Because the genome is known, uh, the, vi the whole virus could be synthesized. Not saying they're synthesizing the whole smallpox virus, just saying it could be done. And that doesn't apply just to China anyway, that applies to everywhere that does virological research. Right, <clears throat> they say this DNA assembly tool applied in virological research could raise a potential um could i'm going to start using a red pen here this is pretty alarming stuff really could also raise potential security concerns well imagine that i just think it could especially when the assembled product contains a full set of genetic material that can be recovered into a contagious pathogen so the genetic material can be taken from the yeast put back into a virus <clears throat> a contagious pathogen uh, recently, a group of scientists was funded by a biotech company to synthesize a full-length horsepox virus genome and recover and recovered it into an infectious virus. So this has been done. In other words, it can be reverse engineered, <coughs> reverse engineered from the yeast back into an infectious virus. Now, I've left all the hyperlinks here, so you click on these in the descriptions, I'll take you straight to them. Um, not surprisingly, such a controversial treatment has received enormous attention and raised a global uh, global debate on its biosecurity implications. Again, hyperlinks there. So it seems the Wuhan Institute of Virology is very aware of these risks and is talking about it. Of course, this paper has been approved by the Wuhan Institute of Virology, 
which, as we've seen, is not open to international um, visitation, shall we, shall we say, uh, let alone international uh, scrutiny. Again, not just the Chinese situation. This will be the same in Port and Down. It will be the same in the, the American uh, facilities where potential military threats are addressed. Um, but some might say that the Wuhan Institute of Virology has been leaky in the past. We have no definitive proof of that, but that has been suggested. But unfortunately, um, the Wuhan Institute of Virology go on to say, in this study, a lower full length viral genome would be ideal reference template. So it would be much better if they could make the whole thing. Um, we only sought to assemble a 55 uh, kilobyte viral fragment, less than one third of the whole monkeypox genome. So in this publication, what they are saying in this publication is they've only synthesized one third of the genome. If they have synthesized the other two thirds of the genome, they're not writing about it here. And of course, we've no reason to suspect that because it's not written here. They've only synthesized a third of it. It would have been better to synthesize the full thing, but because they're responsible and being careful, they, they haven't done that. At least they haven't written about that in this publication. Uh, this assembly product is fail-safe by virtually eliminating any risk of recovery of right. infectious virus uh, while promoting a multiple target. So basically they can use this for testing, mm -hmm. but it's perfectly safe because it's only a third of the virus. Therefore, you can't recover the whole viral genome. Of course, um, it would, would also mean that any uh, less ethical viral constructor in other parts of the world would only have to bother constructing two thirds of the virus rather than the whole thing. Um, there you go. I think I made my concerns about that clear. Um, and more references there. Now, um, just to quickly recap, uh, this seemed to have come from Nigeria, this strain. It seemed to arise in uh, male homosexual events in Spain and Belgium. Um, gay events in Spain and uh, Belgium and spread from there. But the UK seems to have got um, the most number of cases. So that doesn't quite add up. Maybe there's something we don't quite know there yet. But this is spreading in, in male homosexual communities. Um, now, I don't see any particular reason why that should be so. I, I suspect close proximity in uh, heterosexual uh, sexual activity, or not even heterosexual activity, just any close amorous activity would be sufficient to, to uh, spread the virus. Um, I suspect that the fact that it's spreading in the uh, male homosexual communities in Europe is, is a founder effect. It's just where it got to first. And of course, it can spread to uh, other people, uh, certainly because it's a transmissible disease. Um, Unless there's more to come on that, there may well be more to come on that. But in the UK at the moment, last 24 hours, another 11 cases, now got 190. Uh, we've ordered 20,000 additional doses of smallpox vaccine. Note a smallpox vaccine, not a monkeypox vaccine, a smallpox vaccine. Uh, offered to close contacts of those diagnosed with monkeypox to reduce the risk of symptomatic infection and severe illness. So the smallpox vaccine offering protection against monkeypox. Just the same as back in the 1790s, Edward Jenner's cowpox pus from Sarah Nelms, the cowpox that he took the pus from, protected James Phipps, uh, the young boy who he uh, inoculated with cowpox to protect against smallpox. So in the same way now, the smallpox vaccine is giving this cross immunity to protect against uh, monkeypox. Uh, Dr. Rosalind Lewis, WHO expert, it's very important to describe this because it appears an increasing mode of transmission that is uh, been un unrecognised. She's talking there about uh, spread in uh, in the sexual context, particularly in uh, male homosexuality context at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, it will be unfortunate, she says, if monkeypox were to exploit the immunity gap, strange term, I'm not quite sure how scientific that is, left by smallpox 40 years ago. So it's as if there's kind of an equal... It seems to be saying that she's saying that there's kind of an ecological niche, a place to live, that smallpox used to live. But a similar virus could kind of take over that niche, which is a bit strange, really, because smallpox has been um, eradicated, eliminated. So don't quite know what her thinking is there. I'm not quite sure how scientific that is. It's as if each disease has got its own little niche. And if you take that away, another disease will come along to fill it. I'm not sure there's too much scientific evidence for that. Um, but anyway, that's what she's saying. Uh, that, anyway, I agree with her. That would indeed be unfortunate. This is not a disease we want to become endemic. Uh, and she says there's still a window to close the outbreak. Uh, let's hope that before it get that that happens before it gets into animal reservoirs, because if it gets into animal reservoirs, it's going to be very hard to get out of animal reservoirs. So there you go. 
National Institutes of Health and Wuhan Institute of Virology both seem to have uncannily anticipated this. Um, make of that what you uh, will. All right, so now we've got that video out of the way, right? So that's all pretty terrifying, right? Uh, we got more stuff coming in on the Twitter. Uh, let's see, so let's look at the Twitter. Let's look at the tweeter. The tweeter. The tweeter. Let's look at the tweeter. Uh, look at it here in a second. Oh, I no. Oh, okay. So we, okay, let's undo that. Hmm. I guess they have um, connection secure. Oh, you can. Oh, I guess they have a way to verify onion addresses now. Hellenic Academic and Research Institution Certificate Authority. Oh, so you can get a certificate authority for uh, onion sites, huh? Okay, okay. Well, back here. All right. Uh, let's see, what do we have here? There, I know that there's there's usually more stuff on Twitter that usually comes up. Uh, ooh, vac okay, so we've got... Sometimes poll has something on there that's interesting. Uh, don't worry, I got more. But I'm trying to see if there's anything on uh, poll first. Because, of course, I want to be up to date all the latest news. Uh, let's see here. Oh, let's, ba -ba 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 -ba. so we've got, let's see. Oh, no, we got a picture here. Vaccine die-off, it says. Michelob Ultra, Meek Melly. I'm vaxxed, boosted, and this is my, like, third time having COVID since the beginning of this year. Literally, what the fuck? I don't even know where I got it from this time. I'm pissed. Well, why the fuck can't my body just be making the antibodies at this point? I'm confused. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, Michelle, no. No, Michelle. You didn't get the fourth booster, that's why. Takes a shot, gets AIDS. I'm confused. Uh... Thinking on this thought process, I've come up with more questions. What role does graphene play in the COVID shots? So I asked Google, does graphene shield from radiation and came across this interesting tidbit? Graphene composites can block more than 99.99% .99 of high-frequency EM radiation. The researchers found that the best composites had an efficient total electromagnetic interference shielding, se taut of 45 dB in the X-band frequency range while simultaneously providing a high thermal conductivity k of around eight uh watts milli kilo kilometers or um, kilowatts november 2018 high frequency electromagnetic radiation remember that this is the kicker electromagnetic radiation emr from modern cell phone towers is largely comprised of high frequency radio waves or microwaves the adverse biological effects of EMR from cell phone towers have been observed in birds, bees, and humans. Remember when the clot shots were first issued and people joked about getting their 5G upgrade shot to make skeptics look retarded? Maybe they weren't off the mark. Conclusion, COVID and the shots, by extension, may have been used as a cover to hide the damage of 5G and subsequently shield people from 5G. My thoughts, keep an eye on cancer cases in the next few years. Maybe the unvaxxed are more at risk for infrastructure-related damage. I doubt it. I think there's enough damage done by the vaccine already. I don't. Yeah. All righty. Uh, so, do we see anything good? 
on poll right now. Apparently, 1616 is a real number of the beast. What happens tomorrow night? Oh, this is a 16616. Oh, Byzantine text. The mark of the beast. Apparently, 616 is a mark of the beast instead of just 666. Apparently, 616 is the real number of the beast. What happens tomorrow? Um. Revelations 13, 18, the number of the beast. Oh. Yeah, so X, I, C. So, I don't know. I guess that's... 616. Fragment from Papyrus 115 of Revelation in the 66th volume of the Oxy... Oh, Oxy... Cast series that has the number of the beast as 616. Uh, interesting. Anything? Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, do we see anything monkeypox related? Oh, oh no. Oh no. Oh no, oh, this is gross. Oh no, 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 no. Oh. Introducing Gatorade Fit. Make healthy, real hydration part of your healthy routine. And they feature someone who does not appear to be all that healthy. Really, really does not appear to be all that healthy. Uh, let's see, anything else? Um, next go. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'm not really seeing anything. Okay. I don't see anything particularly relevant. Uh if you add the alien disclosure stuff that's been ratcheting up along with the World War III stuff that's been ratcheting up, it's all leading up to aliens saving the world. No, it's not. Okay. Let's look here. There we go. Richard something or other on Twitter. Richard Naher. Okay, this is more supporting evidence. Hox viruses have low evolutionary rates of around one mutation per genome, Per year. The monkeypox sequences associated with the recent outbreak, however, differ by about 40 mutations from viruses sequenced, sequenced four years ago. Uh, Nextstrain.org, monkeypox. Okay. Since 2017, the lineage leading to the recent samples has a peculiar mutation pattern where almost all mutations are G to A or C to T. Furthermore, they almost all occur in specific sequence contexts, as Andrew Rambo's discussion here. Ooh, not good, not good. We have mapped the fraction of all mutations that are either G to A or C to T, and the fraction of them that occur in the specific context G followed by A, or G to A, T preceding C for C to T mutations onto the tree. All right, can we look at this picture? So we've got, I mean, I can't understand any of this. Yeah, no, I, bunch of clades and evolution. All right, this change in mutation pattern likely marks the jump from the original host to humans. Or an intermediate host, where a host enzyme... Oh man, this is just playing so much like COVID all over again. Where from the original host to humans, or an intermediate host, where a host enzyme, maybe APOBEC3, might mutate the genome. The rate of change increased 10 to 20 fold and is now around one change per month. We don't know what these mutations do. The great majority of them are likely inconsequential or deleterious to the virus, and we have no evidence of viral adaptation, but they w will help us tell apart different clusters of the outbreak and understand how the virus spreads. 
Okay. I believe I also, there was also, um, oh. There was another, uh, uh somebody else. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. See what we have here. Isabella Eckerly. I hope I'm wrong, but current monkeypox situation has strong January 2020 vibes. Best case scenarios continuously repeated while the virus keeps spreading. And honestly, we don't really know much about viruses yet. It seems I'm a virologist working on emerging viruses for over 10 years. Okay. Oh. First case of monkeypox in school-aged child was confirmed in Quebec. And no, they did not isolate the class. That's a really high-risk decision. Isolating one class seems like it would be a reasonable measure in order to contain this outbreak were parents notified. I'm just a layperson, but I have the same vibes at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Quebec to start vaccinating against monkeypox with 25 confirmed cases. Really? So the speculation I saw in poll was that what they're going to do, instead of trying to like mass vaccinate the entire population, they're going to try and do like ring vaccination where an individual uh, is uh, deemed to have monkeypox or uh, you're in contact, you know, some contact tracer traces you as being someone who... Uh, came into contact with somebody with monkeypox and um, probably won't be as bad in the United States, I hope, but in Canada, in Australia, you know, you're probably going to see um, people being sent to quarantine camps uh, for being, you know, close contacts. My understanding is that there's going to be a very, very extreme level of pressure on the, uh, ring contacts of an infected individual to be vaccinated. All right, so we've got nextstrain.org, monkeypox, genomic, genomic epidemiology of monkeypox virus. Okay. So we can basically see all the different mutations. So let's see here. Use control. Oh, okay. Let's see here. I'm looking at this map here. It's got uh, big uh, circle clusters over different countries in the world. I see some uh, loop circle clusters over Africa. And then over here in the United States, we have a circle that is two thirds blue and one third yellow. So phylogeny, outbreak associated, blue is no and yellow is yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because we see here we've got uh, this tree here where we have not too many mutations. Um, our mutation is kind of staking. I don't know, it just doesn't seem to be quite as widespread down here in the blue. But then we come up here to the top, we see the yellow, we see a whole bunch of mutations. All right, so I guess those are the outbreak-related mutations. Um, yeah, okay. And then, of course, up here in um, Spain, it's almost all yellow. So almost all, oh, I see. So when I move over the circle, right, the, uh, okay. So most of the strains in the United States are not outbreak related, but one is. Okay. Okay. 
Um, but yeah, we come over here to Spain and the um, most of Europe, it's all yellow. It's yellow, yellow. Finland, yellow. Okay. Discussion of ongoing. Okay. Um, oh, here we go. This is a good. Uh, okay. Discussion of ongoing MPXV genome sequencing. The topic is, uh, is for discussion of the 2022 monkeypox outbreak genomes in phylogenies. Okay. Is there anything interesting here? Uh, first draft genome sequence of monkeypox virus associated with suspected multi country outbreak May 2022. Confirmed case in Portugal. Uh, and, uh, okay, a while back we estimated that the rate of evolution of variola virus, bar of the smallpox virus, to be about 1 times 10 to the negative fifth substitutions per site per year. Birth and others, 2010, which would translate into about 1 to 2 nucleotide changes per year. This is at the high end of estimates. See the paper for others. However, monkeypox may not have exactly the same rate of evolution. Given the disparate positions of the three genomes from the outbreak so far, it seems very likely that the level of noise in the sequencing is outweighing the true signal in the genomes. Uh, share, okay, USA and Portugal share a number of nucleotide differences from the UK genome from 2018, so at least some of these are plausibly real. But as both of these are by nanopore sequencing, it may be that they contain systemic artifacts of the platform. Uh, MA001 uh, exhibits numerous frame shifting single nucleotide incidences, usually adjacent to homoly homopolymorphic runs, characteristic of nanopore errors. Okay. The CDC have. Uh, the CDC have updated the genome for the USA case, which now makes it similar to the Portuguese genome. A maximum likelihood tree now looks like this. Let's see, are we going more recent than when we go down? Okay, more recent when we go down. So I guess the most recent post. Just wanted to point out that if we are considering the APOBEC3 mutation theory is going to be very dependent on which host species the mutations took place. Humans have a much more expanded repertoire of APOBEC3 paralogs than rodents, which mostly only have one double domain A3 protein. The different proteins prefer to mutate Cs in different, uh, different context and may have different cellular localizations, important if a replication takes place in the cytoplasm. Human AC A3G, for example, preferentially mutates Cs in this context. Okay, mouse A uh, mouse A three preferably mutate C's in this context. Relevant publications below. Yes, the Armitage and other papers I cite above is uh, uh, is some work we did a long time ago on VIF deficient HIV grown in cells expressing a blah, blah, blah. look at the wider nucleotide context of of edits. I don't think we will be able to distinguish hosts here, but the Portuguese genomes means that these this does happen in humans, and I think the yellow dots on the phylogenetic tree means it also happens in non-human animals between the human outbreaks and cases. We also have this paper, which, although it is just about apopc 3 g shows blah, 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 okay, okay. Anything interesting over here? Um, okay. At the foundation. Okay. Uh, uh, so I think we've gotten. Oh. Okay. I think we've gotten most of these out of the way. So now it's time to move on. Let's let's put this all in context now.
All right. Let's come to our favorite conspiracy theorist. You know who it is. We're going to watch a video from Cliff. We're going to get the Cliff Notes. That's what we're going to get. And there's going to be a lot to go through here in our Explorer's Guide to Sci-Fi World, Season 1, Episode 15. We've got two new episodes. Two new episodes from Cliff. Oh shit, is it Cliff time? Yes, it's Cliff time. We've gone over the context. We've gone over the context. Now it's time for us to really know what's going on here. Right? Those goddamn Kazarians. Hello, humans. Bam. Hello, humans. Hello, humans. Machine's giving me issues. It's April 27th, and uh, this is an interesting discussion, to me anyway, uh, because we're going to talk about uh, current events, but also future events, and how we're all going to have to react to them. Uh, so, uh, most humans who are religious, in my opinion, have never examined the, um, the nature of their own religion and their interaction with it, okay? So, uh, we see things like, uh, in religions, you'll see uh, like in Christian religions, they say, uh, putting on the armor of God, okay? Now, bear in mind, okay, all right, so, all right, so what does that mean? What does it mean to put on the armor of God? How is that a, um, a thing in reality? Is that uh, to be taken and uh, understood as um, uh, mentally uh, shaping your, your thoughts in a particular way, holding a particular thought, um, uh, getting willpower, uh, getting determination. Uh, it doesn't really, when you start reading into it, it does not really come across quite like that, right? Because they say that these people that have the, if you read through all of the various different texts and stuff, uh, and you see it in other religions as well, um, uh, notably in um, uh, Brahmanism, okay? They're big on faith. They're big on uh, faith. Oh. Most an app, so to speak, is that uh, to be taken and uh, understood as um, uh, mentally uh, shaping your, your thoughts in a particular way, holding a particular thought, um, uh, getting willpower, uh, getting determination. Uh, it doesn't really, when you start reading into it, it does not really come across quite like that, right? Because they say that these people that have the, if you read through all of the various different texts and stuff, uh, and you see it in other religions as well, um, uh, notably in um, uh, Brahmanism, okay? They're big on faith. They're big on uh, faith as uh, an, an adjunct to a human, almost an app, so to speak, right? And you take this on and, you know, you put on the mantle, you put on the armor, you put on the cloak, uh, all of these words about um, becoming embraced by something that is supportive of your uh, self and your efforts and so on, okay? So, uh, so in that sense, if you start getting into faith, you're going to get into the description of what is this. Uh, the religions will take you down all these windy holes and they'll uh, show you different um, uh, analogs and metaphors and, and similes for faith. They'll try and define it in such a way that you become comfortable with this idea that, that is basically, as far as they're concerned, after the word salad, it is indefinable. If you have faith, you know you have faith. If you don't have faith, you may not know it. But you may. You know, it's possible. No, I have no faith in anything, right? Blah, blah, blah. And so you don't have faith. So that means, if we examine this, uh, people discuss it in such a way as they would have uh, faith the way that, that I would hold this box, right? They would have a an, something that is external to them uh, that they can then uh, take into themselves and uh, have faith. And then they become different. They become uh, uh, transmuted. They become transmogrified. Okay, they literally change. This is the idea of faith. If you get into all of these words about it, uh, as I say, word salads, you find that they try and describe it in innumerable different ways, right? Uh, especially if you start getting into 
the really deep stuff in Catholicism, um, even in Judaism, right? They'll discuss faith and so on. But I, I've got a relatively simple definition and a simple approach. Could be 100% wrong, but it sort of works for me, right? And faith is something that you know you have when you experience it. Uh, faith can be derived from a number of different sources, okay? So we have to examine it that way. Faith comes from somewhere. Faith is created within you. Is the idea is that, you know, while they say um, wrap yourself in the uh, cloak of faith, and that's the same phrase, if you go through and look at the um, uh, translations and transliterations, you get the same phrase saying wrap yourself in the armor of God. Now the armor of God thing came in, in like uh, the 1100s. We first see it in places where they actually had metal armor um, as a defensive or, or tough leather armor as a defensive mechanism against arrows and projectiles, stones and that sort of thing. That's the first time that we see this uh, phrase. So armor had to exist before uh, we get the phrase, right? But all of these things say that you put it on. You literally put it on like a garment. And so-and-so wears his faith like a cloak, wears his faith like a garment. He's comfortable in the garment of his faith. You'll find uh, all of these, lots of them are German or Danish or Dutch, uh, Old English, this kind of thing. So they were discussing faith back uh, in like 900s um, uh, up to 1200s uh, in a particular way that we don't see much anymore, okay? They, it, and this really dates from uh, Hellenistic thought, okay? so pre. Platonic, pre-Plato, uh, uh, Greek thought had a really good discussion of, or a really good understanding of faith in my understanding of things, okay? And they, the, the pre-Plato Greeks, and even Plato, he understood faith to be this way, and discusses uh, this with others in the various writings, but uh, faith was understood to be manifest within the body, okay? So something comes along and creates faith that manifests in the body. And then the Greeks, who were um, influenced by... Oh. oh, we're lagging a little bit here. Okay, this is interesting. So, like, faith is like a thing that manifests in the body. I wonder if this has something to do with, like, you know, mind over matter type stuff. You know what I mean? Like, you know how, like, the placebo effect is real, right? You know, you give people a placebo and you tell them it's going to make them better and they will actually kind of improve, actually. I wonder if um, Faith is taking on a similar role here. Oh, come on. Come on, Cliffy. No. No, Cliffy, no. Come on. Come on. We've got so much to go to do here. The various writings, but... Uh Faith was understood to be manifest within the body. Okay, so something comes along and creates faith that manifests in the body. And then the Greeks, who were um, influenced by... Uh oh, no, 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 no. Come on, come on. Okay, we'll give it a second here. We'll give it a second. I have to. Well, let me try a different browser. Yeah. Oh, all right. Let me switch over to my other browser. We'll see if it doesn't lag so much on here. All right. Let's try, come over here, boop, boop, boop. yep, there about it. Right. Bonk. Excellent. Let's try this. Okay. Are we, we left off at about six minutes. Okay, they, it, and this really dates really good discussion of or a really good understanding of faith in my understanding of things okay and they the the pre plato greeks and even plato he understood faith to be this way and discusses uh, this with others in the various writings but uh 
faith was understood to be manifest within the body. Okay, so something comes along and creates faith that manifests in the body. And then the Greeks, who were um, influenced by uh, all of the civilizations to the east of them, uh, which included those that uh, had deep roots in the Sanskrit, where they really went into this stuff, the Brahmanistic um, areas, uh, India, Kashmir, you know, all the way up into the stands. Um, they had an understanding of faith as a physical thing uh, within the body. This physical thing, if you read into the descriptions there and into the Greek, uh, uh, all maps of them very close to the vagus nervous system. So those individuals that had faith may also end up having uh, um, ecstatic, uh, uplifting experiences that are personality shattering and, and go towards uh, ecstasy in the uh, in the Greek understanding of ecstasy, okay, the ecstatic vision, the um, you can't control it. It's it could be induced by a drug. They would get us. They would actually try and duplicate um, ecstasy via drugs um, and inhalation of gases, all different kinds of things. The the mysteries. Um, that uh, Elysium, uh, you'd, you'd drink psychedelics and it was all controlled and so on. They'd kill you if you used this stuff outside of the ritual. But um, they were attempting to, uh, to recreate ecstasy, right? To recreate the idea that um, uh, you had something manifest in you that made you feel very powerful and you knew was not you, was not your ordinary state of being. You'd walk around and uh, you can walk around in faith, but that's an extraordinary state of being. Most people that walk around in in faith, uh, um, in the active sense, the dynamic sense, the manifestation sense, not the, the uh, late Christian, you know, recent Christian idea of faith is somehow as a thought. Um, these people uh, in the old days uh, were discussing faith as an actual feeling, like something vibrating you. And there's all this, these words about uh, vibration about the sparks going down through your arms, the the hairs rising up off your body, the hairs on the back of your your neck, uh, you know, standing out, um, your skin swelling, uh, the blood pumping, all of these things. So if you look at their discussion of faith in that period of time, and you read the Old English, and you read even in uh, Codex or Alinda, you'll see. Uh, references to this, right? Eight, in 800 AD, they were discussing these uh, effects that were quite common in humans, enough common enough to be reported on, discussed openly, etc. And so you'd say, oh, wow, I had a faith episode last night, right? Now, in those days, you didn't necessarily tie faith in um, with, a, with a Godhead, with a, uh, an omniscient, uh, omnipresent uh, kind of a thing, right? Uh, faith had, was known to have a number of uh, possible causes of, of sources, one of which was spirit, as they, they describe it, that which animates, animate, that which moves matter. Um, because we're qualitatively different as humans uh, from lumps of rock, all right? I know people that are like lumps of rock, but they breathe, and rocks don't breathe the same way humans do. So humans are qualitatively different. When did he say breathe, or did he say breed? Am I right? Makes them different is the animus, the uh, movement of matter by way of spirit. Uh, the non-corporeal, okay? So something, usually non-corporeal, introduces faith, which is a non-corporeal thing, but has a corporeal, a, 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 a quantitatively assayable corporeal component, in the sense that when people are in the midst of faith, you can observe it as an outside observer. Uh, this is a complicated subject, and I'm going around and about because I need to get into some various different as aspects of it. But I have seen, I've witnessed um, people being in a faith state, all right, where they're all charged up, they're all spiked up on stuff, and we would call this in Aikido, we would call this a big key state, right? Your body is just flowing with that animus, with the key energy. Um, and you have faith, you are in a midst of a faith episode when that is happening to you, even though there's not necessarily a religious component to it. So you could have that same faith 
that same effect, the, you know, the, the flush of blood, the, the whole body effect on the, on the back of the shoulders and the, and the big muscles of the back going down through the, the glutes into the, into the thigh muscles, into the quads, right? This is where it's usually felt. These are the uh, largest bands of the vagus nervous system. Now, the vagus nervous system has all of these tie-ins to the brain. And it is the largest nervous system, uh, is a, uh, okay, so you have two separate nervous systems. The vagus nervous system is larger and connects all the major organs except the adrenals, the adrenal glands, but it connects all of the glands in the head as well as the major nerves going into the brain. Very interesting kind of a critter, these vagus nervous things that we're carrying around. Anyway, so when uh, people are in this uh, faith episode, from the outside, if you're, especially if you're looking for it, you can observe it, right? And so... Um, there's faith without religion. So I could have faith, I've done this, I've, I've gotten all fired up and I was just charged and ready to go and this kind of stuff when I was working at Microsoft and we had this big uh, contention over a particular way with some software. And I knew these fuckers were wrong, that it wasn't gonna work the way that they wanted to. And I had faith because I had confidence in my conclusion. And so even though there was a whole room of people, there was like 60 people in this room saying I was wrong, I was a stupid idiot, blah, blah, blah. Now bear in mind, they were prejudiced, okay? So Microsoft is a bunch of prejudiced fuckers. All these people have, in huge degrees, uh, degrees up the yin-yang, they're very young, they're prodigies, and they're all like each other. And here I was, tw 10 to 12 to 15 years older than most of the fuckers I was coding with. I had no degree, I was self-taught, um, and so there were actually holes in my knowledge because I'd not gone to school on this shit, right? But on the other hand, I had some very intense, deep knowledge because I'd had a lot of work experience and come up through the telephony industry. And, and knew about computers and stuff from the hardware side, from the ring zero and the chips and so on, right? And so I knew what things would happen. So when I was at Microsoft in this one particular episode, there was a big room, there were a lot of people on my case, and I was not gonna back down. I had to drive all the way up from Olympia to uh, Redmond. Uh, at that time, it wasn't that bad because I was leaving real early, driving from like four until about 5.30 to get there. Um, I get on in, I get breakfast, I come on into, I think we were in building number six at that time, uh, the bigger building with a little amphitheater in it. Um, and uh, uh, they were, uh, we were discussing this networking issue and which way the code had to go. And I kept telling them, you're wrong for this reason, you're wrong for this reason. And, and I had to do this for like three and a half to four hours, okay, because they were really, really on my case, but the head of the project uh, was doubtful. He was, he's, he was a nice guy, he was um, uh, Persian, and he wouldn't say he was Iranian, he was Persian, he was an expat, and he uh, didn't like groupthink, <laughs> okay, and he knew he was, he was up against groupthink. And the problem with this is that they could have engineered a solution, their approach, uh, but it might have taken them six or eight months and it would have ballooned the code way the hell out and it wasn't necessary, right? And in fact, they would have, in the ballooning of that code, they would have ended up with the same solution that, that I had proposed way back when. And I was just confident in my, my solution because of the only way out of this particular latency and concurrency issue uh, with transmitting data across um, uh, networks. Anyway, um, the upshot was I was correct and after about three and a half hours, um, the, the head of the project basically said, well, uh, you guys can't actually show any technical reason that, that Cliff's wrong, so we're gonna work his approach until you can. Well, we worked my approach, it was only about two weeks, and it was done, right? Instead of this six month giant uh, clusterfuck that they were all headed towards. And so it was good, I got, actually got a bonus out of that job. It chopped off uh, about uh, maybe as much as three quarters of a million dollars in coding time and reduced the code base way the hell down. This was at the point where Microsoft still had connections to IBM and uh, Microsoft actually had this deal where if you could reduce the code without adding a bug to it, you got a bonus because you shrunk the number of lines of code. This was just their ethos in going forward. Anyway, so I had faith in my uh, solution and I stood up there and I took all of their uh, slings and arrows, right? I just took it all because I knew I was right. I had confidence. I knew my solution would work even if theirs would as well. And I also knew mine was cheaper uh, because I'm a cheap bastard, <laughs> right? So anyway, um, so there we are. We've, we've got the faith. I felt it. In that, in that meeting, I was charged up. I had big key. I was doing a lot of Aikido at the time. It wasn't that difficult to gin it up, um, and especially for a fight. So, uh, so my experience of faith at that point I knew as soon as I felt the, the vagus nerve response, right, as soon as I felt the hairs going up on my back and all of this kind of stuff, all of the effective uh, body clues that you're in a state of faith, then I knew my conclusion was accurate and I would stand by it and I just was not going to back down and there was nothing they could do to make me back down on this. It was just a weird situation. Um, you know, he could have said, the boss there could have said, ah, eh, screw it, let's do both. He, he could have said, no, Cliff, you're wrong, and I would have acquiesced, right? But as long as he was not intruding, he let the fight go on until he was satisfied, and then it was about three and a half hours, everybody had to pee, we had to go get food, 
And uh, so he made a decision, we went with mine, and it worked out fine. Um, which, of course, reinforces my faith from confidence. So if I have a conclusion and I'm confident in my, my conclusion, I have past episodes where I was correct, and so it, it supports the faith feeling even more. Now, you can get faith from a number of different sources. Uh, but they all basically come down to something that motivates you to feel a physical response to a, a mental state, okay? This mental state uh, is also emotional. And so that's, that's what triggers the whole feeling of faith. So faith absent feeling is not faith, okay? It's a thought. Um, maybe it's an, you know, a notion or something like this, but it's not faith. Um, it can be well formed, well thought out, uh, you can live your life by it, but it is not faith, okay? Faith is an actual physical uh, interaction with uh, universe around something that is non-corporeal, that doesn't really exist. So this is why you can have faith from religions, you can have faith from basically any kind of a thought. So we see this misplaced frequently, mostly. We see faith in gamblers. Ooh, I feel the luck, ooh, yeah, 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 let's double down. Eh, okay, so they have faith. Sometimes even they will have the full body experience, the full vagus nerve uh, experience. Frequently and mostly, they will trick themselves, gamblers, that uh, people that can't help it, um, uh, they're intrigued and, and pushed that way by their karma, will trick themselves into thinking that they're feeling the faith, but it's this sort of washed out, and there's all kinds of discussions way back in the old text and also in the modern, um, like uh, modern, I mean like say 16, 17, and 1800s, uh, you get a lot of um, uh, people that made the, the uh, conversion out of the Byzantine Empire into Catholicism, and they brought with them this basically Eastern tradition that's more meditative, more contemplative, and in those volumes they discuss uh, weak faith versus real faith and so on, right? And so uh, you could have faith in your authority where, you know, you're a Nazi in the Ukraine and they tell you, we're winning, we're winning, go on out, go on out. But as soon as you encounter a reality and, and it shows that you're not winning and all of that, your, your faith in your, in your authority is gone, right? Don't, you'll never recover that because if faith does not survive impact to reality, then it disappears, it just evaporates, just fades right away. And you're left with this, um, what'd they call it? Something like a stone, okay? So I, I can't remember the exact phrase, uh, but the Greeks had this idea that when faith was shown to be false, you would have the stone feeling, which is like you've swallowed a stone in the pit of your stomach. There's just this cold knot down there, right? And you know that at that point, it's sort of like the reverse of faith. You know that it's not gonna work out, that all of this kind of thing. So um, the reason for the whole damn discussion here is that we're about to have a crisis of faith as a result, globally, as a result of uh, the convergence of where we're at now with the uh, upcoming history that's gonna be coming out about humans. Okay, so it's gonna going get to, good, it's gonna get right, good. So, um, all us guys, uh, are gonna meet humans and meet humanity basically for the first time. And it's gonna be met in the woo uh, because a lot of the stuff we're gonna be presented is not gonna be factual or maybe factual, but we can't validate it at the point we first come in contact with it. And, and we know that there's gonna be a lot of um, uh, disinformation we have to clear out of the way because we've been sold a bill of goods as to what humanity is. So we're gonna have this convergence um, with religion and it is necessary in my mind that we separate the idea of faith, which I find very valuable um, and, and want to have in my life, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we need to, in my opinion, we need to separate the idea of faith from the source, okay? So we could have a uh, misinterpretation, a wrong view of the facts of a religion, and yet the religion can still be valuable, and the faith that it produces can still be valid, okay? Uh, difficult situation. So we're getting into a period of time where... Okay, so basically, something like uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, whatever, could still be valuable, even if it's not true. Okay. I can see that. Like religion performing like a certain function within society, and you can't just remove religion without it. Um, I mean, it's like the fence problem. It's, like it's G.K. Chesterton's fence problem, right? You, before you remove the fence, you need to know who put it there and whether or not it's still serving its purpose. Um, we're going to have a collision 
between the reality of the Christian and Islamic view of the Old Testament uh, is, is the view of the Old Testament from these two religions, officially and unofficially, is going to be impacted by the history that's going to be coming out. This history is going to um, provide the opportunity for lots Hold on, I'll be right back. I know it's frustrating. Uh, I gotta go do something really quick. I'll be, we'll be right back.
Okay, I'm sorry about the pause there. Something came up and I had to attend to it. No other way to go. Right. And lots and lots of people to actually go and look what was said in the Bible. So if you want to do that, now bear in mind, you need to sequester your faith, right? Take your faith out of this loop, out of this equation, while you're examining um, the nature of where we're at and what has happened to us <laughs> as humans, okay? And so if you wanted to do that, if you were strong enough, then I would recommend, and I rarely recommend this kind of stuff, but I would recommend you go and read Mauro Biglino's book, uh, or the book about him, which is actually a translated uh, set of interviews from him, and it's called The Naked Bible. The Naked his Bible. Name is Mauro Biglino. He's Italian. Uh, the reason to understand that Mauro Biglino is, is um, is the perfect person to do this work that he's done is because of this is the man that the Catholic Church goes to to get translations of their source material Ooh. in Hebrew and Aramaic okay <coughs> in all these languages so Mauro Biglino knows more about the Bible than anybody uh, in the Vatican when the Vatican wants to know anything about the Bible they go and talk to him it's even more impressive than that because he's talking about the whole Bible but he's talking about um, the Old Testament specifically, and written in Hebrew, and various shades of Hebrew over time, Maro is the translator that the Jewish rabbis go to when they want Hebrew to be translated effectively for themselves. So he's that good, right? He's, he's the top dog on the planet. Uh, this is the biggest, baddest dog for translation in these languages that you're ever, ever going to run across. And his naked Bible will totally change your understanding of the Bible and where humans are related to the history of all of this. Now, you need not read this because, in my opinion, we're very, very close to that history coming out independent of the Bible. And so we're gonna have this collision, and we're gonna have a collision of the religions, the main monotheistic religions, uh, against their own history. And that uh, collision is going to cause many people to lose faith. And I'm of the opinion that if they sequester their faith and just say, I will weather this storm, and when this information comes out, which I find disturbing now, I will find that at the, at the other side of it, everything will be okay, right? That there will be a greater understanding that um, I can apply to my life and I will actually be better for the experience of going through all of this history and everything that we're all going through because we're coming to an understanding of reality and we've been lied to for so long and so much has been um, deliberately changed and uh, garbage spewed out to us. So in my way of thinking, if I were to be a religious person, I would want to know what was in the uh, religion that I was actually practicing, right? I would want to know every last detail of it and the why about it. Uh, but a lot of people may not. They may just decide, nope, don't want to know that, right? But they will still, unfortunately, have to deal with the generalized um, uh, history uh, that is expressed within this is going to be coming out and it's going to affect the religious structures uh, gigantically, like like <laughs> totally remove the foundations for them, and totally spread them all out for everybody to examine, uh, you know, get into the gooey parts and smoosh it all about just so we can see what's going on. That's gonna happen independent of the uh, this particular um, uh, initiative that's been going on for a number of years. Now, Morrow's been working on this stuff for decades. Um, he's got a number of monographs out there. Uh, I may have even uh, produced a book. Um, he's got a YouTube channel if you wanna go and uh, listen to him talk about it uh, in his interviews and so on. So uh, you can really get into it, right? So now, uh, as I was saying, I think faith is valuable. I use faith, right? I used it at Microsoft in that. I use faith in my ability in Aikido, um, uh, in, in actual fights with people, right? Someone comes to assault me, I don't care how big they are, I have faith in my ability to really fucking fight. Uh, so, uh, and as soon as I'm in that situation, instantly I get the faith, I, I get the armor of God. And, uh, you know, and you're in for some deep shit. Even if you win, <laughs> you're going to take some serious crap. Um, so, anyway. Now, uh, there's a lot of things that are related here, okay? And so, um, the reason I know that we're about to have this historical uh, upwelling of information uh, that will affect the religions, but it's not directed at the religion. So, in other words, we're going to find true human history about, or true history about humans, and in so doing, uh, getting the true history about humanity, we are going to naturally disturb the mythos of all of the major monotheistic religions. Um, less so Judaism than all others. If you read this book, you'll understand why. Uh, but in any event, this is occurring because there's been a, a confluence, a convergence of events going on around the planet. 
Now, I'm not going to get into the deep history of it all. Uh, you can go and investigate this yourself. But there is a another language um, discovery out there. Okay, so so we have discovered a uh, we've discovered a language that uh, is called first tongue. Okay, first tongue. They're also calling it Proto Hebrew. I don't like that so much because I don't find it. Um, is the Proto Hebrew. I think it's. Um, I, I don't. I don't think it is a Proto Hebrew. What you're writing there, but Rabbi? The, the point of this is that they've actually got it mapped to uh, Hebraic um, uh, lettering characters, and they've got it mapped to them um, pretty consistently from the pictographs down condensed. And I agree that the pic pictographs could be easily condensed down into this uh, what they call Proto Hebrew. But I think that the first tongue. Um, existed, and then from first tongue, we get the um, formation out of that of Hebrew. Okay, so I'm not saying it's a proto-Hebrew. I'm saying it was a remnant language. So I think a first tongue is actually first in the previous, right? So it comes from a previous level of humanity. This previous level is a remnant. A remnant that has left... Um, that um, that has left the planet littered with this first tongue. I say littered because we're finding it uh, all over in the western part of the Americas. Uh, we find first tongue uh, pictographs and engravings in Colorado, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and California. They may exist up here, but I haven't gone over east of the mountains to, to the Badlands to look for them. Trying to work that out in a few weeks to go to this particular site. Um, anyway, we won't go into that. Uh, this first tongue is a complete full language, uh, very much like Hebrew in the sense early Hebrew, uh, from which you know we think Hebrew came out of first tongue. Um, uh, no vowels, but a consistent uh, consonant, um, constant uh, language showing up in all these places. It's also in Sinai. It's in Turkey. Uh, it's in Russia. Uh, it may be in Siberia, and it's kind of interesting. Now, there's a guy that produced a. Um, uh, a single page uh, web um, application that will translate this stuff for you, right? You can type it in and look at it and you can see the various forms of the letters. And so you could also go and take, take your laptop and go take pictures of some of these pic pictographs and then, and then map them to the, the language and start to understand some of the things that are scratched in the rocks all around us out here in the desert, this kind of thing, right? And, uh, and as I say, now it's in Mexico, it's all the way, all up and down the, the it's on the West Coast. Uh, in both Americas, in, in all three Americas, North America, Central America, and South America. You find this stuff scratched in the rocks everywhere. So here is a language that existed around the planet. Find it in Sinai. Find it in Africa. Uh, I don't know about Australia, likely, uh, and that region, and nor do I know about the Polynesian islands. But I know that Polynesian islands are filled with pictographs. Now, are they the same? I don't know. Um, anyway, though, so pretty soon, the emergence of first tongue will have more support behind it, academic as well as the technical support to, to allow for translations. We, there's a lot we don't know about it in terms of how it's organized. And a lot of the, the writings in it are not organized. They're scratched on rocks. Some of the rock has fallen away. So we've got a, a lot of learning curve there, right? But we think, a lot of us, and I don't know how Morrow feels about this. He's gonna, I'm going to have to ask him about how he feels about first tongue. Uh, but I'm of the opinion that it is a remnant and that um, it was a sort of a method of continuance, that it is the bridge language from the previous uh, Ice Age civilization, pre-Ice Age, last Ice Age civilization. So we had a civilization here that was wiped out or destroyed by the Ice Age um, that was itself ended 12,000 years ago. That previous civilization built pyramids, all of these kind of things, um, and created, you know, uh, all of the uh, massive um, monuments, the monoliths, uh, all of these kind of constructions. And what we have of them is stone, basically, but up until this point, none of the ephemera, right? None of their thoughts or these kind of things. Now we find first tongue scratched into stones all over the place. And so uh, we're getting into a period of time where the information from first tongue is going to come on out. And I'm quite sure, because it so far predates uh, the monotheistic religions, that, that it is going to provide us with all different kinds of information about what was going on here as we made the transition, as humanity made the transition out of the last ice age. Now. Basically, our history is that we had the last ice age, um, and it ended approximately 12,000 years ago. And so we can just take that number and run with it at the moment. And so we have 12,000 years ago, uh, we get these comets or whatever the hell, and the 
ice is destroyed. Now, 12,000 years back. Okay, well, basically shit happens, and then approximately 5,000 years ago, um, the Elohim come down, the El come, right? The El get here. Uh, the Elohim, which is many of them, show up and start fucking with humanity. This is why the Jewish calendar is, is the age it is. This is why uh, a lot of Christians say that the earth is that old and so on and so on. They actually haven't read the Bible, so they don't know what, what it actually says. They're just going on the stories they've been told about it. But So we know that these people came down here about that period of time. But we had a civilization here long before these guys fucked around with these remnant people. The remnant people are the pre-Adamites uh, who are described as hunter-gatherers. But these hunter-gatherers are... Um, very sophisticated remnant civilizations from the Ice Age and that catastrophe that, that hit humanity at that point. There's tons of history, okay? Tons and tons and tons of history that's going to be coming out. Um, the particulars about First Tongue and whether it predates, whether it goes back beyond that, I think we'll be solving those uh, relatively shortly, like within the next 10 years. We'll find some evidence in some places where it could not have existed from 12,000. So we may find a cave that's been sealed up longer than that that has first tongue markings in it. We may even find such things as books with first tongue written in it. Uh, that's not beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, you know, we've got the Dead Sea Scrolls that, you know, go back thousands of years. We've got um, metal tablets, lead, copper, and so on that, that survive and go back uh, even longer. So, and we've got stone carving. So I, I suspect that we'll find that it does indeed go back before um, and that it is a remnant. It came forward with the, the people here that survived oh. through the Ice Age. Anyway, so. Oh, no. Are you in buffer hell? Uh-oh. Buffer hell. Oh, no. I, oh, I see it. I see it. Uh oh. Okay. Let's see here if I can. Uh, let's see if I can save you. Screen output. Uh. Uh. Okay. Well, hopefully it's recovered now. Okay. I mean, my, my little uh, buffer thing, uh, my quality deal here, it's flashing green and yellow, green and yellow. So, yeah, that's not, that's not too good. All right. All right. Because we got another one after this. This isn't the end. There's more. This convergence of uh, the convergency is going to hit religion is going to come out in a number of different ways. At the same time that th all of this information is going to be coming out and making itself uh, known, because we're getting into truth now, so even if it hurts, you've got to examine that truth to find out really what the fuck's going on, because so much has been obscured, right? But So we'll, we'll face all of these things, and as I say, my personal uh, impression of all of this information is that it is um, supportive of, of faith in your religious view, okay, if you're a religious person. Um, and I say this because I know that there's all this other shit that's coming out as well, <laughs> okay? So all different kinds of other things are gonna be emerging. Uh, but what we're gonna have to go through is this destruction period. So we will see the Catholic Church destroyed. We'll see the Protestant churches destroyed. Not because of the first tongue or, or the, uh, their articles of faith, so to speak, right? Uh, but rather because of the corruption of the people running it and the history of that corruption. And so uh, the, the adherents will leave the churches because they are so corrupt and they are so evil. And the church structures will dissolve. They'll also dissolve because the money will be taken away. Uh, Bison Chili is on a simmer. Boosted that bitch with a ghost pepper sauce on top. Three other peppers I chopped fresh living on the edge tonight. Oh, Bison Chili. Oh, man. Spice and chili. I've never had that before. I got to try that. Yeah, okay. So everyone's going to leave the Catholic and the Protestant church. They're going to see how corrupt they are. I, weird. He didn't mention the, anything about the Orthodox churches. Maybe he's including them in Catholic. I don't know. Oh, well, we'll see. As the central banks fail. Bear in mind, basically, the Catholic church is supported by central banking around the planet. All churches are, are um, intimately tied to the central banks, and they don't exist absent debt-based funding. Um, Ooh, that's a red pill. Churches don't exist absent debt-based funding. 
Uh, I won't go into the details about that, but we're coming up to this point of a convergency, an emergent, emerging emergency as a result of a convergence of our history, uh, actual history coming on out at the same time that we're uh, going through this uh, uh, crisis of corruption globally that's affecting all institutions. And so uh, we're in a, one of these major, major kind of periods. Uh, we could conceive of the time we are in now as being every bit as chaotic and uh, eventful as the Revolutionary War here in the United States, actually much more so, much more so eventful, much more uh, activity than that period. Uh, this is the equivalent of um, all the revolutions that have ever happened before. So the revolution in China and in Russia and all of this, the, the period of time we're in now will last for a long time, I think at least 18 years, and will be uh, much more eventful in terms of the changes that will affect humanity. In my opinion, we're coming up to an interesting one that uh, is going to be involving this first tongue um, and uh, the ability for us to glean information from way deep in humanity's history and to even find out what is history and what is not, which is very important to us because we need truth. We need facts, all right, because faith is not supported by myth. Faith is supported by facts, however dirty and gritty. So one of the things about that Microsoft thing was that nobody wanted to hear what I had to say because of uh, the crisis that it caused uh, in the, the situation. It was an ugly truth they had to hear. And I, I hammered that ugly truth for three and a half fucking hours. And finally, they accepted it. And once we accepted it and dealt with it, we were beyond it in like two or three weeks. Uh, but if we hadn't done that, we would have been, it would have been one of those projects. I'm convinced of this. I have faith in this conclusion. It would have been one of those projects where they would have thrown more people, more money, more people, more money, and we would have ended. Uh, neither does uh, churches don't exist absent debt based funding sure but neither does just but any other institution yeah but i think churches kind of present themselves as being kind of you know what i mean like you think oh but the church was founded by god it doesn't require a central banking system to exist does it you know what i mean like like it makes sense if like the department of homeland security doesn't exist without a central banking system right it, it, the Department of Housing doesn't exist without a banking system. That's not a red pill, right? But then, like, you know, your church goes away. Like, what? With an operational failure. It worked, but half-assed sort of constantly needing maintenance, constantly being tweaked, etc. And it had to do with um, uh, object-oriented encapsulation and the need to bust the, um, uh, the hymen, the encapsulation um, barrier. Okay, which it, it, long and involved, you don't care about that. But anyway, so the, the faith was justified, right? And it worked out for everybody. So I'm at that point now where I'm having faith in um, the emergence of a rebirth, a refeeling, um, a reconnection to faith within humanity. Okay, not faith in humanity. I have faith in humanity. You know, I know we're a bunch of idiots and bumbling toads, but we keep progressing, right? So I have faith in humanity such as it is. But we're going to have faith within humanity that will survive what's going to be coming up. And I think that people just, uh, in my opinion, because I'm through this, right? I've gone through this um, uh, information as much as I'm able to get at this point and see how things are shaking out. And so I have faith in the conclusions that I'm coming to about this situation and how it's going to play. Um, you'll see this over this year. You'll see large chunks of this information come out over this year. M many people will not be paying attention to it because of all the political and economic problems that will be going on. So it may be 2024 before we see the first cracks appear in the, maybe, maybe 2023. I don't, it's hard to estimate as to how um, rapidly the impact will spread once it reaches uh, certain key areas. Uh, so it'd be like, um, uh, uh, in a congregation uh, of in any faith, you'll find, say, three or four uh, people that are the anchors, okay, in, in that congregation. They're the steadfast, the um, continuously there, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know these individuals. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, most churches, they pass around the basket, the, you know, the, the collection thing. I always... I always thought that was like, if anytime you're passing, I know, I know it's normal. I remember growing up, it was pretty normal to pass around the collection. Uh, basket during uh, usually I, I think they usually did it right before communion um, I hadn't been to a Lutheran church in a long time but last time I went um, you had to have like a communion card or something this was like I don't know 2010 yeah they you had to have like a communion card or something to show that you'd like pay your dues or something to receive communion I was like oh wow but I always thought that was really distasteful to have like a collection um, 
offering thing going around, you know? I've always thought that was like, what? Yeah. But I've been to churches that don't do that, though. And so we can't anticipate how this will uh, work out because we don't know how long it will take for the steadfast to encounter this information and then decide to examine it and then decide to incorporate it into their understanding of the reality of our reality. And when that happens, that's when the cracks appear in the in the institution that we call the church, right? And so I can't anticipate how long that will take because those same steadfast individuals are also the conservative ones that are going to be out fighting the um, culture wars and attempting to uh, retrieve the, the um, conservative nature of the social order in order that that social order may go forward. And so they're going to be occupied. They're going to be busy. But we also have other things that are going to intrude in on this. One big wild card is whether or not, or rather when, because I think they will, when will uh, the current powers that be who are dying, who are losing their power, when will they play the UFO card? At that point, that could cause uh, cracks in institutional religion as that institutional religion comes under the assault of the space aliens. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, it's a weird subject, guys. Um, I'm just basically doing this because I know people of faith, right? I know a lot of Christians. I like them. They're good guys. Uh, I know Muslim people. They're good guys. The people of faith are good guys. Uh, they're attempting to do good, right? Uh, they're not attempting to necessarily constantly further their own aims like the fucktards that are uh, running things now. And so I value faith in myself, but also in other people. And I, I'm concerned that what we're going to be going through, if they don't have any warning that, that there's information is coming out and so on, may be an assault on their faith that might be um, overwhelming. And it need not be, okay? Because if you have a vision of coming through it, if you have the faith that you will come through it with your faith on the other side, then you will do so. It, it won't be the same. It'll be an entirely different understanding of reality, but the faith itself will be the same. The same feeling, the same, uh, you know, armor of God kind of approach, that sort of thing, right? And um, uh, so, I, as I say, I was concerned. I thought to bring it up, uh, sort of a uh, heads up, guys, a, a fair warning on a situation that's developing. And uh, basically, here's how I know it's developing, and I'm seeing a lot of activity in the first tongue stuff and in other areas that I know will be propelling this information along. And it is... Um, uh, it won't be able to be resisted at some point. It'll be out there and everybody will... Or lot I would say, you know, the one thing that does kind of have me kind of interested, um, I guess he's almost done, but yeah, the one thing, whenever he talks about the first tongue, it just kind of reminds me when I was um, taking like a intro to uh, interpersonal communications course, and it was a part of our book where they talked about the history. Um, I think it was the king of Prussia wanted to know... Um, what the natural first human language was. And so he uh, ran an experiment. I mean, it's not too, too, totally related, but it's kind of interesting. He ran an experiment where he instructed the uh, wet nurses at the nursery to never speak to the infants in the nursery, uh, I guess, at the royal nursery. And the, and the reason why he didn't want them to speak to the infants at all is because he wanted to see what language the infants would naturally... He, he worried that if, you know, um, anyone spoke a language around the infants, that it would bias them to that language and they would mimic it. So he, was, he thought, well, if we don't speak around them, then they'll speak a language that is the natural human language. Um, anyway, long story short, the children actually all died um, due to lack of uh, interpersonal contact. I guess, uh, basically, apparently, children need to hear language. Or at the very least, need to hear their parents speak. Uh, or the wet nurses speak in this case. So, anyway, I'm always, any anyone, anytime anybody talk about, like, a search for the first or the original human language, I'm always kind of reminded of that experiment. Lots of people will be discussing it. So, other people, especially the people of faith, will run into it. And then they'll have to decide, you know, are they going to deny that it is factual or what, and so on, and, and how they're going to adapt to it. Um, but should think about it now. And faith is valuable, uh, in my understanding, uh, and is something to be preserved, independent, independent of the um, facts, as you understand them, about your religion, 
the nature of that religion that you share with other individuals, your experience of that religion and your experience of faith is valuable. It's a necessary part of being a human. I couldn't imagine living without it, and uh, it is valuable. And I'm just saying, don't let the shit that's rolling down on us here crush that, right? Um, uh, separate it and just say, in my way of thinking here, uh, you know, this too will pass. I will be changed as a result of this passing, but faith will remain. To the new me that's changed, it'll still be my faith, right? So anyway, though, um, uh, one of the few times I'll get real preachy about this, I actually wanted to set out to do some other stuff here, but the religion convergence is coming out pretty quick. Um, I suspect we'll be uh, starting into it in a real way in July or August of this year, and then it's going to run for a number of years, percolating in the background as we go along as, as more stuff comes out. So anyway, <laughs> keep the faith, guys. All right. We will. We will. We'll keep the faith. Don't worry. Don't worry, Cliff. We'll keep the faith. Okay, now he's got another one. We're not done. It took us a long time to get through that one. Okay, medbeds and the Cathari. Okay, medbeds, biotronics, and crusaders and Cathars. Oh, we are going to get into it. We are going to get into it. Hello. Uh, okay, what's this? Viewzone.com. First tongue, an ancient global language introduced by Gary Vay. Above, Colorado wall, originally enhanced with aluminum powder on location, but here, um, but here enhanced with white in Photoshop to reveal shapes. Oh. In the last part of the 20th century, a handful of archaeologists discovered a collection of symbols carved in stone as petroglyphs that appeared to be writing. Initial dating of these symbols show that they were made over an extended period of time, beginning around 1700 BC and located on as many as five continents. This unique collection of symbols was first examined in the Negev Desert of Israel by Dr. James Harris, a brilliant archaeologist from Brigham Young University. He identified the symbols as alphabet in the Proto-Canaanite language which he successfully translated by using old Hebrew phonetic sounds. The earliest examples of this writing were first described as graffiti left by workers of turquoise mines. Later, excellent examples were found in a mining site that collapsed and remained intact from around 1500 BC. Established by carbon-14 dating of wooden beams, Used to support the tunnels, this discovery was called Old Negev by Harris because of its location in the Israeli desert. In the late 1990s, William McGlone, an amateur archaeologist and retired space engineer, discovered the same collection of symbols carved in heavily uh, patented stone, uh, patented stones surrounding the southeast Colorado town of La, La Junta, dating to the patina correspond dating to the patina corresponded to the same era as the writing found in Harkakom uh, in Israel. McGlone documented the locations of this writing before his untimely death in 1998. Prior to this, he gave many of his maps and notes to Gary Vey, editor of ViewZone. Vey was able, with the help of Dr. Harris, to successfully translate many of these old petroglyphs and develop a computer program to do this in the field. In 1999, ViewZone visited and photographed the petroglyphs in Colorado and, and, and posted them on the internet for com uh, comments. And then a few years, images of similar petroglyphs were sent to Vey by archaeologists and historians from many global locations. This included a huge, refined collection of writing from the Republic of Yemen at the site of the newly discovered place of the Queen of Shibe. Bay was immediately invited to visit the museums and archaeological sites in Yemen and photographed as well as translated many of the older stones and bronze artifacts. The writing in Colorado and Yemen spoke of some event possibly related to the sun. Oh, okay, this is interesting. The writing in Colorado and Yemen spoke to some event possibly related to the sun, uh, which was... Oh, that's funny. The link, the link at the bottom here is viewzone.com slash end times 2x, <laughs> which was prophesied to change human civilization. 
Subsequent translations of sites in Oklahoma, Australia, and South America have added more details about this future event. However, the present report is meant to describe and illustrate the ancient writing system, which we are calling First Tongue. It is similar to Proto-Canaanite, but, but because it seems to predate the Canaanites, the use of First Tongue is preferred. Huh. What is this? Hmm. There's no sound. I think they're just showing rocks with carvings in them. Yeah. Okay, so we've got rocks. I guess this is in Colorado, maybe. With carvings in them. Okay. Yar equals praise, fear. E the L Lord. Oh. Huh. All righty, let's move on to the next one. This is going to get deep. It's going to get deep. While you're feeling faithful, pray for me. Chili is done. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah, sure. Got to have faith that the chili is going to be good. I have faith that the chili is going to be hot. All right. So I guess, I guess he's talking about faith as like a feeling. And as a feeling, it's a tool. So... Faith isn't just something that comes from religion, right? Like you can have faith, like he's talking about having faith in his own abilities, faith in like his martial arts skills, faith in other kinds. Of, right. And that happens all the time, actually. You know, we like all the time we make little assumptions. Really, faith, I mean, if anything, it's just an assumption usually based on experience, right? And it comes in contact reality with reality and the assumption either gets strengthened or weakened. And um, yeah. Hello, humans. Hello, humans. Oh, this is going to be deep. Okay, we got to change that. Okay, so let me get this changed. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> it's the 6th of May, and um, uh, just a, it's been a long time. I needed to get some stuff um, out there because we're about to... Uh, hit some inflection points here in May that are going to be, oh, disturbing for a lot of people, but, um, well, disturbing for, for probably almost everybody in some degree, uh, but not necessarily bad things in general because we're going to overcome all of these sorts of things, and I'm talking about the economics and the politics and all that sort of thing. Um, okay, so by way of um, uh, disclaimer, uh, okay, so hang on a second. How do we start this? All right, so there was this group of people uh, that in Europe, in the, from like the, maybe 700s. Now, bear in mind, all these numbers are bogus. The Khazarian Mafia has been fucking with history for years, getting different kinds of numbers in place and, and duplicating and expanding history to make themselves all puffed up and so on, saying that, you know, their lineage is real long and all these sorts of things. So we can't trust any of the numbers. But using the generally accepted uh, numbers for our uh, recent history of these several thousand years, uh, there is a group of people that in from about the 600s, um, uh, so about 630 maybe um, AD um, in Europe, uh, were known as the Cathars, okay, the Cathari, and uh, they are, uh, boy, I can't get into all of this history, it'd take literally days or weeks. There's vast amounts of history, I'll put some links to some of the his historical references to the Cathars, to the Cathari, uh, that have some validity to them. So you have to, again, you got to take everything you read about the Cathars with a grain of salt. The reason, you know, you have to disbelieve most of it, you have to validate most of it, because the history is deliberately obscured by the Catholic Church. Um, so if you read the uh, Codex Oralinda, you run across the people that are the Cathari, Cathari. And the Cathari are an interesting group, but let me get back to the, to the disclaimer. By way of disclaimer, on both sides of my family, my mother's side and my father's side, we are Cathari, all right? We're descended from the Cathari. Uh, my father from the Germanic, uh, the Teutonic version of them, and my mother from the Franco, the French version of them. So um, my father's people were uh, driven out, in the, uh, out of uh, southern, southeastern Germany and eventually settled in Scotland and England. Um, and that began in like the uh, late 900s, okay? Ugh, what the hell was that? 
Uh oh. They're coming for our boy. They're coming. They're coming to get our boy. Somebody, somebody must have swatted him. Damn, Kazars. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. It was an eagle landing very heavy on the roof because he's carrying a fish. So uh, it was like, <laughs> so anyway, um, it's a big hollow building and it sort of echoed in here. Sorry about that. Okay, so, um, so my father's family uh, was uh, suppressed by the Catholic Church in the great um, German Inquisition uh, that ex extended over several hundred years. And the Catholic Church would, they'd basically march out of um, Rome, come on up into southern Germany and wipe out all the women, steal all the children, and uh, uh, wipe out all the women, as I say, uh, claiming them to be witches. And um, uh, it, was, it was a slave trade kind of thing, right? It was a very aggressive deal. And they were doing this against the Cathars you know, for a couple hundred years in Germany, but, and this was the German Inquisition. That was the, uh, the horror that uh, led to the Catholic Church refining the techniques they used on the um, um, unconverted Jews in Spain uh, later on in the 1500s, okay? The 14 and 1500s. Uh, well, 13, 14, and 1500s. Anyway, so the Catholic Church is, um, they're my enemy, right, historically. Uh, okay, so there's two Catholic Inquisitions, the one that we know about in the Middle Ages and then the one in the 600s in Germany. Okay, I'm assuming the first one, quite a bit more brutal. Okay, so they come in, they declare all the women to be witches, Something along those lines. Um, the organization. And um, so about the 1200s, uh, the late 1100s, early into the 1200s, the Catholic Church turned, they pretty much wiped out the Cathars in Germany, put them underground. That's one of our traditions is that we're underground. We don't tell people shit about ourselves. Um, anyway, so uh, as you can see, <laughs> you know, with, with good reason, it's a survival issue. Uh, the Catholic Church declared the Cathars finally in the 1100s. Up until that point, they had just been one, yet one, of the unrepentant, unabsorbed Christian sects. Okay, so up until the... Uh, I think it was like 1189, we'll have to go dig into the Vatican's uh, records to find out. Up until about that period of time, the, the Catholic Church considered the Cathars uh, basically like the Essenes, okay, from which um, uh, Joshua, that we call Jesus, uh, was extracted. The Essenes are a Gnostic sect, okay, they are known as the enumerators. They like numbers and they write lists, that's their whole thing, right, is the, the, the Essenes were under, uh, I won't go into it, but anyway, the Essenes are known as the enumerators because they liked uh, listing things and finding things out. The Cathars uh, were also considered to be one of these uh, heretic Christian sects. Now, I'll put stuff in there that'll tell you about the Cathars. Um, bear in mind that most of this history is bogus because it's written from a Christian perspective, a Catholic perspective, and it's been um, polluted by that perspective over all these, these um, uh, millennia, over a millennia plus, right? Because it goes back to about, as I say, the 600s. Um, the persecutions began in the 800s and we've been suffering them ever since. And finally, there was the great push in the early 1200s where the um, uh, the, the Templars, okay, so the Cathars in France uh, extended as far north as a little bit past Rouen, which is a village in northern France. You can't see it here, but it's, it's up approaching towards um, the border with, um, uh, well, actually, Alsace Lorraine, Germany. It's over towards that way, but there's Rouen up in here on the river there. Just north of there, you got to get into um, uh, uh, Holland and in that area, right? The, the Netherlands, the Low Countries. Anyway, um, my mother's people were out of Rouen, and they were forced out. So my father's people were forced out in the uh, late 1100s over into um, England and uh, Scotland, from which they came to the U.S. My mother's people were um, uh, denied entry into England. The English wouldn't have them because they were fighting with the French at the time. And uh, so at this point, and also they were having their own issues with the Templars. The Templars were allied with the Cathars politically and um, economically in many different ways. Not religious, the Cathars in no way participated with um, crusades. It was against the uh, ethos of the group to, to go and do this kind of stuff. It was a real problem for the French who were trying to get up these big crusades. Anyway, there was this giant crusade to eliminate the Cathars in the 1200s, and it pushed all the Cathars out of France over the course of about 120 years or so. It moved all of these groups of people out of uh, France, slaughtered many of them. It's known as the expulsion of the Cathars from France uh, in that period. And it's um, basically like what the, some groups had done to um, uh, other Cathars in other situations, uh, even though at that time, or, or prior to that time, they were, all, they were considered to be basically in the same religion, just a her heretical sect, right? It was sort of like Sunni and Shia in, in Muslim world. They fight each other, they don't agree, and that kind of stuff, but they both sort of acknowledge that each other are Muslim, um, you know, in some degree, right? And so this was the state of uh, the Cathars and the Christians. Now, the Catholic Church declared that, um, the Pope declared that the Cathars were not Christian and therefore could be, have a crusade against them. They got a big crusade against them and they flushed all the Cathars out of France. Now we're talking about moving um, a core group of probably uh, close to three quarters of a million people out of Europe, uh, 250,000 easily in, in um, a couple of areas in southern France. Uh, my mother's people in Rouen were at the far northern extent of the Cathars. And the Cathars are not a warring people. Um, 
uh, they're self in self into self-defense, but they're not aggressive in that sense. They go out, don't go out and conquer territory that way. The s one of the central things about the Cathars is that they work. So there's no, okay, so Cathars have these people that would be thought of as priests. Uh, they're called the perfecti, okay? And uh, then there are the people that are on their way to becoming perfecti, and these are the cred credentes. Uh, it comes from the same root word as credential. Um, and these are people that prove their worth, all right? But here's the thing. Uh, in the Cathar tradition, everybody works, all right? Work is a sacrament. And thus, there's natural outcomes to this. So there's no such thing as a priest that sits on his ass and takes money uh, from parishioners and lives on those uh, donations and stuff. That's not the structure that is organized within the Cathars. Everybody works. The um, uh, donations to the uh, common good uh, do not include uh, supporting people that have no other job. So even the people that we would think of as priests, and they're really not priests because there was no dogma per se, there was no uh, codification at that level, uh, although there was a um, ritualization of certain things, uh, there wasn't this written down um, catechism kind of thing, right? So it's a different approach to things. Anyway, and also a very different tradition, very, very, very different tradition, because the Cathars knew that the uh, Old Testament never should have been part of what was, um, that came out of the Essene Joshua. And that's how he's known as Joshua the Essene, um, not Jesus, right? Um, anyway, so, um, uh, the Cathars, as workers, naturally produced. They made things. And so uh, energy begats wealth, right? If you do something and you make something, you benefit from having made that thing in so many different ways. And so there is this natural um, side effect of the particular ethos of the Cathars, and that is that they become wealthy over time because everybody works all the time. And it's a joyous kind of a work, right? Anyway, so... Uh, the Cathars are uh, uh, an anathema, right, uh, to the Catholic Church, that which the Catholic Church hates. Uh, they can't have people that are self-determining, and there's decentralized Catholic, the Cathars would have no church in their territory. They would not have any uh, organization that they did not, uh, they would not allow the, the Catholics to uh, put a priest or a um, structure of a church in their territory. This really pissed the Catholics off. So the Cathars cannot be uh, proselytized, they can't be um, infiltrated that way, right, because they accept no power structure. And so they accept, basically, the, the ruling is that there, or the, the understanding is, that there is no separation between man and God, uh, except what man might put there. And, um, and you allow no man to separate you from source, from, your, from the Godhead. So um, anyway, the Cathars knew that the Old Testament never should have been joined to the New Testament, to the New Covenant, that the Old Testament was uh, lies. And they've known this since um, early, early translation. Holy shit. Old Testament was lies. Are you hearing this? I mean, that's like the biggest thing. Every time anybody Christ, uh, criticizes Christianity, they say, well, what about, you know, the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament? Now we're hearing it straight from the horse's mouth. Old Testament lies. Lies. Holy shit. That's a red pill. The Cathars are very, they work all the time. They're very uh, literate. Um, they produce, they have their an understanding of education that is not schooling. Uh, they have the understanding of reincarnation. Uh, that was one of the things that really pissed the church off. They'd spent the last 300 years from like uh, the very end part of the um, uh, Constantinian collection of, of Christian sects. At the very end there, there was the Catholic Church and then there were a couple of these heretic sects like the Cathars that had enough believers, enough adherents that the Catholic Church couldn't just roll over them. Now bear in mind that the Cathars work. They're, they're also um, very martial. There's a martial tradition, a martial arts tradition within the Catharian uh, understanding of the world, that the world is harsh because one of the, okay, so there's two premises, uh, reincarnation, metempsychoses, right? And then and decentralization. That's another big premise that we accept no central authority, nothing between you and, and um, the source. Um, but there's also this uh, other tradition there uh, within the Cathar understanding of duality and uh, duality in universe good versus evil so you know uh, if you're a Cathar that evil exists and therefore um, you must defend yourself against it you know it is your your task in universe and materium to work on this on the side of good and resist evil and that's just one of the things you do um, and so it's the same uh, from this tradition uh, that the Cathars have the Sufis take uh, their approach of um, uh, that ultimately became twisted and so on into what we think of as jihad now, which they have as holy war. But that jihad, actually, the word means internal struggle, it means exactly the same thing as the words kung fu, right, which is internal work. And so um, the Cathars have this internal work um, ethos. And so they were, as I say, an anathema to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church could not exist with them. They were finding that the Cathars were spreading very fast among the Franks and among the Gauls. Um, they'd uh, also been had to be rooted out in the Teutons, and that was a hell of a battle, and it cost the Catholic Church um, much wealth and uh, um, was a, a big drag down on them, right? Now, all this was before the discovery of the, of the United States, or the North America and South America, et cetera, right? But the Cathars, going back to the 600s, had a tradition that they knew that the Cathari, the Cathari, did not exist and did not come out of the Middle East, okay? That Godhead did not arise out of uh, Israel or any of that, and that most of the books of the Old Testament are describing evil. And, and so, 
so you get this thing, right, where from a Catholic's perspective in the Middle Ages, especially the Catholic serfs and all these people that are uneducated, can't read, and relying on the priests to badly interpret and tell them stories out of this book that supposedly was written by God or, or inspired by God, and in fact is just the family history of the Israeli Israelites dealing with this um, space alien uh, called Yahweh, who was one of 240, over 240. We know that there were over 240 of the El, the Elohim here on Okay, so the Old Testament is just a family history of the Israelites dealing with a space alien called Yahweh, who was one of the 240 Elohim on this planet. What in the fuck? What in the book? Are you mind blown yet? Can we get any deeper? Earth in 15 of these Gons, G-A-N-S. Gons is not translated as garden. That's what the Catholic Church and all of these people would translate it to, the Garden of Eden. And it's E-D-I-N, right? It's a, it's a particular place name that describes basically uh, Mesopotamia here down through uh, the Fertile Crescent into Egypt, okay? So the Cathari up here knew that their tradition, their civilization came from North America. That in fact it came from the center back over here, which was one of the first that was established. So when the Elohim came to Earth, they established these 15 genetic centers that they called Gons. In the Gons, the description of it in the uh, Cathari understanding is that these are literally actually bubbles over, and they're, they're like um, force fields. They're, they're bubbles over areas that alter the, the relationship of the environment. It is an encapsulation that these Gons, these gardens, uh, inappropriate translation, are encapsulations. They're laboratories. And Holy shit. So, okay, so the Garden of Eden right? It wasn't a garden. It was a gone and it was a laboratory. Oh my God. So the Elohim come down to earth, right? 5,000 years, 5,000 BC, which is why, um, Christians think that the earth started in five in 6,000 years ago, whatever. They think that the earth is only 6,000 years old because that's when the Elohim came and they started messing around with the hunt, primitive hunter-gatherers who were the remnants of a pre-Ice Age civilization and that that Ice Age ended around the year 12,000. Oh my God, you have no idea how many connections in my head. Okay, I, I gotta, let's see. Um, let me see if I can bring this up. Uh, so... Plato, uh, ancient and priest, uh, uh, BC. I don't know. Okay, so basically, there's this dialogue from Plato where he's talking to one of these Egyptian priests, right? He's talking to the Egyptian priest Solon. And Solon is telling him, you Greeks are young, you have young science, nothing that you have is aged. Whereas we Egyptians record a history uh, as old as this. And he tells him about this time when the son of, when it was the son of the sun god took his father's reins, um, but he could not hold them. And so he crashed from the heavens to the earth, setting the earth on fire. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, Leto Egyptian Solon. Atlantis Solon. Okay, Plato meets the... Okay, Solon the lawgiver. Okay. Here we go. Solon. Okay, the story is well known and comes in Plato's Timaeus. Solon, the lawgiver, has traveled to Egypt. Is it showing up on the yeah, it's on. As, as tra okay, uh, has traveled to Egypt and there in the city of Sais, he speaks to one old priest who tells him how nine thousand years before. Okay, so Plato lived, I think he was, um, gosh, when was that, 500 BC? Anyway, so 9,000 years before, right, so that would be about um, 12,000 years to us, right, had, had about 2,000 years, maybe plus 500, 
Right. So not, not 9,000 years before, a power named Atlantis had fought against Europe and Asia. These passages are celebrated. In fact, they are a fundamental part of the canon of Western knowledge. Whether as metaphor or darkly twisted truth, however, there is a passage at the beginning that is overlooked, at least has been overlooked by me in the past. In, the, uh, in, in it, the priest named Doubtfully Sanchez by Plutarch in a later age described periodic catastrophes breezing over the earth, destroying knowledge and memory. This is why, according to Plato, the Greeks retain no memory of Atlantis. Thereupon, one of the priests, who was of a very great age, said, O Solon, Solon, you Hellenes are never anything but children, and there is not an old man among you. Solon, in return, asked him what he meant. I mean to say, he replied, that in mind you are all young. There is no old opinion handed down among you by ancient tradition nor any science which is hoary with age, and I will tell you why. There have been, and will be again, many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water, and other lesser ones by innumerable other causes. There is a story which even you have preserved, that once upon a time, Pantheon, the son of Helios, having yoked the steed uh, in his father's a chariot, because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father, burnt up all that was upon the earth, and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Now this has the form of a myth, but really signifies declination of the bodies moving in the heavens around the earth, and a great conflagration of things upon the earth, which recurs after long intervals. At such times, those who live upon the mountains and in the dry and lofty places are more liable to destruction than those who dwell by rivers or uh, on the seashore. And from this calamity, the Nile, who is our never and failing Savior, delivers and preserves us, when, on the other hand, the gods purge the earth with the deluge of water, the survivors in your country are herdsmen and shepherds who dwell in the mountains. Yeah. But those who, like you, live in cities are carried by the rivers into the sea, whereas in this land neither then nor at any other time does the water come down from above in the, on the fields, having always a tendency to come up from below, for which reason the traditions preserved here are the most ancient. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. So basically, yeah. So long, sucker! Oh, God, okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. Gotta bail, keep blowing minds. All right. Thank you for the, thank you for the dono. The kind of laboratory is that the Elohim were able to throw up an electrical shield, an sh um, electromagnetic shield that prevented the air from coming in and uh, filtered what light came through. Now light is very important to the Catharians, okay? And this is why we're generally working our way towards the understanding of medbeds and discussing that. But anyway, so, in the 600s, according to my family tradition that I get from both sides of my family, and, and bear in mind that this is a traumatic event, right? And so one of the things about the Catharians is that there are people among the perfecti, among the religious part of it, those that are good credentes, um, that are moving their way up into what we can think of as priesthood, they are required to carry the knowledge. And they are required to carry it in a particular way, uh, basically, that we would describe as a grudge, okay? So I'm a holding a grudge for my family that goes back um, in my father's lineage, back into the 1100s, and in my mother's lineage, back into the 1200s. Because uh, we were, um, we were assaulted and, uh, and our, um, well, our, our people were, were crushed. They were killed. There was a crusade. There were, uh, it was recorded that there were 200,000 of the Cathari in southern France that were killed. Now, it wasn't all of them. They moved. A lot of them went into Spain. My mother's people went out of, they were far north, so they were the ones that were first hit. And they had to move through the south 
and uh, they ended up in, going over uh, Spain and into Portugal, and from Portugal they went to the Azor, Azores, a small island chain there. We know it with the La Palma volcano now. And from there, they went over to the Caribbean. So um, the pirates of the Caribbean are Cathars, okay, the remnants of the Cathari, um, uh, I, I don't want to say religion because it's more than that, right? It's a lifestyle. It's, um, uh, the Cathari don't really proselytize. They don't try and convert people or any of that. We just, we just work, okay? And, and in doing our work, we advance. And if others want to follow, they follow, and that's fine. Uh, but because we're decentralized and this kind of thing, there's no possibility of a flood of um, uh, converts that would overturn the nature of the, uh, of the religion. It's not really a religion, it's an ethos. Um, there's a big difference because there's no dogma per se, right? Um, anyway, so the Cathari uh, became the pirates of the Caribbean. Now, my mother's people uh, were Caribbean pirates. My father's people left Scotland and came over through uh, New York and it ended up moving over into Central America, uh, central part of the U.S., right? My mother's people were pirates of the Caribbean when the British got really, really pissed at them a few hundred years later, and there was this big effort on the part of the British to uh, destroy the, the Caribbean pirates here because they were raiding the ships of these people as they were attempting to get slaves and spices and all of this kind of stuff into their rum factories here. Bear in mind that, that they were producing rum in Cuba just like 20 years after um, Columbus, right? So, so in the early 1500s. Um, maybe even before that, but in any event, so um, when the English came down and had their big uh, purge and pogrom, uh, my mother's people, the, the pirates of the Caribbean, moved uh, out of the Caribbean and they went up the uh, Louisiana um, Mississippi River Delta. They took uh, refuge there. They weren't able to be pursued there because they had smaller, shallower draft vessels and the big heavy boats of the British could not navigate, nor could they understand the stell and the, the na navigation markers within the very large complex of the Mississippi Delta at that time. Bear in mind, there's no structures there. It was a wild delta changing all the time. You had to know what the fuck you were doing, otherwise your boat would be uh, moored in the, in the mud. You'd never get off. You'd die there because you couldn't walk out. Um, anyway, and so they actually went up into central U.S. by way of the Mississippi River. And so then we have our history, um, my mother and family, my mother's family and my father's family here in the U.S. that, that comes from that old uh, connection back through into the Cathars. Okay, so now, uh, the Cathari are, um, in their understanding, there was a civilization wave that came out of the Olmecs that was the Central America Gons. There were, there were 15 of these Gons, 15 of these laboratories, these bio laboratories that were established. Wherever the, we find these bio um, labs established, we find a bloom, an unexplained bloom that um, led Darwin to postulate wild fucking fantasies and create his uh, evolution of the species, survival of the species, writing all of this, which may be in fact have some validity for those species that humans have not fucked with, or the Elohim have not fucked with, uh, but that's a lot of species. Between the Elohim and ourselves, we've fucked with a lot of species and taken them out of the idea of evolution. So, the, these 15 gons, these 15 biolabs that were established to create new forms of life and to fuck around with us, the, the primary one, as far as we know, was over here in the in the Central America. Okay, now, in 14, okay, in 13 of those uh, areas that they landed, we find this bloom of new plants, new new kinds of life. So in the in South America, we get this sudden change uh, for potatoes to be able to be digested. Digested in one fucking generation, it accomplished like, say. 55,000 years of slow evolutionary kind of progress? No, okay, in one generation it went from this narrow little tuber that, that was poisonous, seriously poisonous. If you'd eat it, you would die that fucking day, probably within mere hours. Um, it went from there to what we know as potatoes today. And all of the grains, all of the different kinds of grains and foods and so on in uh, Central America, in uh, North America, Central America, and South America, all relate to a specific time. At the same time, we get the change from spelt to actual wheat um, in the, the central um, Eurasia. There's all these kinds of things where there was a, a bloom that happened in a very short period of time, approximately 6,000 years ago, when we think of agriculture spontaneously, according to our, our fucking academic history and these stupid ass um, uh, professors, uh, our, our agriculture suddenly arose naturally out of humans. And all of a sudden we discovered that, that spelt had turned into wheat and that this other ugly little thing turned into potatoes. And in fact, not only had turned in po into potatoes, had turned into 300 fucking varieties of potatoes. And we find that the wheat had turned into hundreds of varieties of wheat. 
And all of these things magically happened at the same period of time, and it happened in these 13 centers around the planet. Okay, one of those centers was in Antarctica. We don't know what the fuck is there, right? One of these gons is in, in Antarctica. Another one of these gons disappeared, okay? And this, this gons was over here, um, uh, over near, and it may have been one of the first ones, over near the Bahamas. And it was um, uh, subsumed. So there was some kind of a flood, and that, that center was taken out. And so we were left, so we start off with uh, 15 of these centers, one of which becomes, goes dormant, uh, becomes unknown, and disappears from our lineage in Antarctica. Now bear in mind, the Cathars in France, in the, uh, uh, I know from reading the Codex Oralinda and other volumes, that they were discussing Antarctica uh, in the 800s. 800 AD, they knew about Antarctica, and they knew that the Gons had gone dead there. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, no, nothing reported. But this is where it starts getting interesting. So we have the 13 tribes of Jews. Well, hey, we've also got 13 of these Gons because two of them have died off, right? Uh, one disappeared in a flood, one went silent, but all the others were still functioning. These Gons were why, these, these bubbles were why uh, the Jews recorded that they were able to have long-lived ancestors um, serving Yahweh, which is one of these uh, 240 Elohim who came down. More than 240, right? Uh, that's, that's what we know is that there's more than 240 because we don't know. Uh, we just have had a, a sampling. We knew of existence of 240, but we knew there were more than that, but we just don't know how many more. And this, this forms an issue with um, the, uh, that's a b common bond between the Essenes and the, uh, the Gnostics and the Cathars. Now, the Cathars are sort of a kind of a Gnostic. N not, not quite. They're not in the Hypatia line of Gnosticism, but they share many of the same uh, traits, okay? And so if you, and if you want to get into it, you can get into some serious history on the Cathars. But bear in mind, most of it contains errors. Uh, they may not be deliberate, but some are, because the Catholic Church deliberately pollutes um, and has uh, since the, the 1200s. They deliberately pollute history to scrub their own crimes and make themselves look good because they've been infiltrated by the Khazarians. And the Khazarian Mafia represents the side of evil. Here, bubbles were why uh, the Jews recorded that they were able to have long-lived ancestors um, serving Yahweh, which is one of these uh, 240 Elohim who came down. More than 240, right? Uh, that's, that's what we know is that there's more than 240 because we don't know. Uh, we just have had a, s a sampling. We knew of existence of 240, but we knew there were more than that, but we just don't know how many more. And this, this forms an issue with um, the, uh, that's a b common bond between the Essenes and the, uh, the Gnostics and the Cathars. Now, the Cathars are sort of a kind of a Gnostic. N not, not quite. They're not in the Hypatia line of Gnosticism, but they share many of the same uh, traits, okay? And so if you, and if you want to get into it, you can get into some serious history on the Cathars, but bear in mind, most of it contains errors. Uh, they may not be deliberate, but some are, because the Catholic Church deliberately pollutes um, and has uh, since the, the 1200s. They deliberately pollute history to scrub their own crimes and make themselves look good because they've been infiltrated by the Khazarians. And the Khazarian Mafia represents the side of evil here on this planet. And as a Cathari, there is a duality. You recognize that good and evil exists, and you can tell the difference between the two, and you resist if you don't cooperate with evil. And so this is just what you do. And you have to decide, and it's up to you to decide. No priest is going to tell you, no fucking rabbi, to, no judge to tell you what is forbidden to you and, and not. Um, anyway, so the Cathari are very interesting. So the Cathari predate Maro, right? They knew that the Old Testament, they, they understood Hebrew. They, they um, Cathari are linguists. So I'm, I'm a Cathari, right? Like my mom always used to give me shit saying, you know, um, well, I won't go into it, but she always used to say, you come by it naturally, right? So my stubbornness, my like, loving of the sea, my loving of languages and studying um, knowledge, et cetera, is, is baked into my cells, made a uh, part of my genetics because I am a Cathari by genetics. Anyway, so, and this is just, just the way it is. We're just this way. Um, and the love of work, it's just inculcated into us, right? So, um, so naturally, if you work all the time and you're not a lazy ass, you get shit done and you accumulate. And so you grow over time. And this is a resentment uh, and you get uh, a lot of shit from the priest class who do not work and who only, uh, you know, fuck little kids and torture and this kind of thing, right? And, and uh, invent new money games and all of these kinds of things. And so we find that, that naturally there is a separation between the Cathari and many of the um, other peoples uh, around the planet here and, uh, and the separation is into the ethos and how the ethos is uh, inculcated into the individual Cathari. Now, bear in mind, the Cathars don't exist anymore, right? And so I'm talking about a lost people. Only are they. Hmm. We'll leave that for a mystery for another time. But let's move on now, okay? So 
Uh, there is a there is a no dogma. There is no catechism. Uh, there are rituals and there are songs. Okay, and the Cathari have songs. The Cathari are are very much into energy, and in their songs they un, uh, represent uh, and discuss the energy of life and so on. And one of these songs is called the Song of the Sun, and it's this greeting song that you do uh, every morning when you do this ritual greeting to the sun, kind of like the sun salutation in yoga. And so there are physical exercises that the Cathari do. And in general, you can see, you know, as a Cathari, we're we're fit. We we train our our children from. Uh, very, very, very young in all these exercises. And, and if you read the Codex Oralinde, you find that 11, age 11 is when you start training the male children. And age 13, if they want to, you train female children in the martial arts. Uh, female children that don't want to train in the martial arts are insisted upon training in, in, when they're 15, okay? Uh, there's reasons for this. But so even, so all females will train in some level of weapons. Um, and uh, all males will train in the martial arts. You're allowed to drop out. You, if you have no feeling for it, that's fine. But the males must train from 11, age 11 until 17. And at age 17, if they show skill, uh, they're given weapons and invited in as warriors. Otherwise, they become um, uh, part of the body of the Cathars, right? They need not become warriors. Uh, it's not demanded of everyone, but uh, it is demanded that you at least are proficient enough to, to uh, keep yourself alive and, and give a good account of yourself when you're set upon, because you will be set upon by life. We know this. And so everyone trains. Uh, those who have acumen are uh, provided by universe with that acumen. Therefore, it is assumed that universe wants to promote their um, continued schooling along those lines. And these are just the things that you do. These are the traditions. Now, part of our traditions, as I say, are the, uh, the rituals, the, the, the linguistics, okay? And it's, and it's, there's all kinds of esoteric shit. You can get into some really deep stuff like the power words and certain phonemes and how they're, um, used and so on and when and, and their aspects and use in martial arts as well as in mental calming and these kinds of things. But uh, our point is not to get bogged down in the weeds of all of this, right? But there is, as I say, this greeting to the sun that you do every day when you get up. And I'm not going to go through it in length. It's a song. It's best sung. And I do not sing. <laughs> I'm a very terrible singer. <laughs> the universe did not provide me with any um, any ability that way at all, so I won't won't uh, attempt it to you. And also, in my opinion, uh, the it's best the the solare, um, which is sort of like solari, the Catherine Austin Fitz. And for a while, I wondered if she was one of the um, the obscured ones, the hidden ones. Okay, because we do have that tradition that there are pockets of Cathari that are still uh, observant and uh, scattered around the planet and ready for a particular kind of um, a resurrection, so to speak. It doesn't quite go that way, and I'll get into that at some point in the future, the, the prophetic aspect of the Cathari. Uh, but so I wondered if, if Catherine Austin Fitz, through naming her thing Solari, was um, referencing Solar I, uh, which is the, um, the Song of the Sun, and it's the greeting for the first part of the day. And in there, in that greeting, uh, some of the words, as I say, it's best said in French, it's best sung in French, it's very melodious. Um, but anyway, the, the phrase goes, um, uh, it starts off with, um, uh, universe provides and guides uh, my eyes to see, my voice to say, how wondrous is each day. And then it goes on to the listing of this particular day that I'm in, okay? But it starts off with this general phrase. Um, it is from that song that the New Age people come up with this love and light phrase, which really irritates me because they don't understand it, right? They say, oh, love and light, love and light, and they don't have a fucking clue. Okay, so a uh, little bit of history aside, now we're going to go into a little bit of science. Okay, so um, the Cathari, by tradition, are scientists. You find that, that we are natural scientists. Um, it's necessary to be a good worker to understand the nature of wood, so you're going to be a scientist about wood if you're a woodworker and so on, right? You're going to really delve into it because from the Cathari's viewpoint, um, there is nothing simple in the materium and that there's always something else to be revealed if you look my eyes to see, my voice to say. So if you see something, you say something in order to enlighten the other Cathari, right? To spread the word. And, and um, so this is just the, the structure of how we do it. But the, the Solari ends in the phrase of light and love, okay? Not love and light, and there's a reason for this. And that is because a lot of the Solari is, is trying to inculcate into small children, and that's why you do the songs, is that, that the children will, uh, they, they like the rhythmic po approach. You know, two years old, you, you can get a kid just happier than hell, giving them little language things to play with. And so um, from that point on, you get them into all these songs, and so it becomes inculcated, so you just you couldn't forget if you tried. Anyway, so a lot of the Solari and a lot of the ritual um, uh, 
sayings and phrases of the Cathar, they all relate to energy. And uh, it is at this point that we start shading over into the, the concept here that I wanted to, to do, discuss today, now that we're into this some 38 minutes, um, and that is light, okay? So, so I'm in the process of getting deep into this subject that's called biophotonics. Um, part of the history of it all goes back into the 1920s and the separation. In the 1920s, we had a separation where the Khazarians came on in and they removed Tesla from history and shoved in Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein is a name stealer. Okay, he's a Khazarian masquerading as a Jew. He was a plagiarist. He didn't come up with E equals MC squared. He did not in any way participate in the patent that he actually has his name on for refrigeration. And uh, none of his patent work was in any way his own work. He was a plagiarist of others. There were many, many, many complaints against him as a patent clerk for um, within, in, I won't go into it, but in any event, so the, the Khazarians, the name stealers, like to pump themselves up into history and they put people into history and take the work of other people and pump these guys up with that. And so, Cathari, we don't like name stealers, okay? You can't be a name stealer because that's another separation from, of you from source. If you're a name stealer, you're damaging yourself as a human by getting involved in all of this bullshit that the Elohim brought down with them. Again, another subject for another couple of hours worth of lectures, but it's not, not pertinent for today. Today we're gonna talk about the light part of this. Now you got some name stealers out there. Charlie Ward, Simon Parks, they're evil fuckers, okay? Uh, you've got people supporting Charlie Ward and uh, Simon Parks uh, and that are duped by evil fuckers. These would be like, um, oh, Michael Jaco, uh, he might be an evil fucker too because he promotes such weird shit. Um, you've got uh, uh, the whole crew out there that's promoting him. You know, you got people that have been sucked into it like Mel Kay. Uh, she thinks she's a Jew, she's a Khazarian. Uh, she didn't, probably doesn't know she's a Khazarian. She actually probably believes that she's Jewish and this kind of thing, but she's promoting name stealing and promoting uh, um, Charlie Ward. Uh, and Vander Steele, all of these people. I don't know why they're, they've got good followers and they, they should be much more, you know, um, center alternative kind of people. But here they are shading way over with uh, Charlie Ward and these other name stealer guys, right? Now, Charlie Ward and, and Simon Parks are big on med beds and they're just pumping out all this idea that, oh, med beds are gonna come on out and, and uh, Simon Parks is, a, you know, connecting consciousness group is, is gonna be the, the, the entree to med beds into the world and stuff. It's like, okay, guys, you know, you're so full of shit that I can smell the stench of you, you know, uh, half a world away. So I can sit here and, yep, that's the stink of Simon Parks. And, oh, my God, oh, my God, that's Charlie Ward. Oh, geez, the stench of him, you know. Um, you know, they need um, uh, hazmat suits and something out of men in black just to, just to deal with the stench of Charlie Ward. Uh, and these guys are promoting the med beds. Well, here's the thing, guys. Um, I can tell you now that med beds will exist, even though they don't now, and that they won't be electric, okay? I mean, they'll have electric motors and this kind of thing, and, and we'll use electricity, but they're not going to be inserting electricity into you. So as part of my Catharian uh, tradition, and, and learning is one of them, edu self-education is one of them, I've pursued all different kinds of science, because of course I had this 30-year this bout with, 30-plus um, year bout with uh, cancer that was undiagnosed. And so I was always trying to find what was wrong with me and so on. So I investigated all different kinds of stuff. Um, Skinars are pumping electricity into you from uh, the Russians. Really good devices, okay? Uh, magnetic bracelets to ward off uh, or to reduce um, arthritis problems, right? You get these at Amazon, they're real cheap. They're, they're in the martial arts tr tradition and, and they're, they really work. Okay, so um, anyway, so, um, so I investigate all this stuff and I go way deep, right? And then I work my way back out. I always love going way deep to the, find the, the point in history that we see the first occurrence of it, and then I work my way back out on my research and decide what's good, what's bad, and where to, where to go. So I'm investigating this stuff called biophotonics, right? Biophotonics. So we're dealing with photons, which are produced by biology. And so it turns out that here's the thing. So in every cell, we have the, the various little organelles, you know, the mitochondria, uh, various little bits and pieces of the cell that do things. But in every cell, for every one second, we have 100,000 chemical operations going on in that cell. Bear in mind, you're composed of 10 trillion cells. And another thing here, 42, okay? So you start off as a clump of two cells, um, the gamete, okay? Uh. Oh, sorry. Uh, the gamete doubles. 
splits and to go from two cells to four, from four to eight, etc. right? If you do this 42 times, you come up with 10 trillion. That's how many cells you've got in your body. Okay, so that's why 42 was the answer in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's the answer to life, universe, and everything. It takes 42 doublings to create an adult human. 42 cell doublings. Um, when you end up with the 10 trillion cells, bear in mind that all 10 trillion of these guys are having 100,000 or more chemical reactions each and every second going on in them. Now here's the thing about that. If you start looking at the actual mathematics involved in this, you cannot do this. You can't do this. We could not control this level of action in a single cell, let alone 10 trillion that are intercooperating. So you've got cells over here that are having their mitochondria do one thing, the organelles over here do something else, and so on. But these two cells are cooperating with each other as part of the 10 trillion in your body. And all of your body is cooperating with each other in all of these 10 trillion cells. And so they're all talking to each other. If we analyze this, it cannot happen that this is done at an electromagnetic level. So we are electric beings living in an electric universe. Okay, and, and at a gross level, we see electricity exist all around us, even like static electricity walking across carpets and shit, right? In the, if I actually analyze it, we could not create a computer now that could effectively manage at this speed, right here, 100,000 per second or more, could not manage a single cell effectively. It wouldn't do it, it would break down. The, the computer program just could not do it, let alone doing 10 trillion cells. It has to do with the issue of electricity and the transmission of information electrically between the various parts of the cell and then between the, uh, among the cells themselves. Uh, it would just be, uh, the electricity is just too slow. So we know that it's light. Now in the 1920s, um, we get the work of a number of people. Uh, I like um, Vernadsky. Okay, he's a Russian, Vladimir Vernadsky. Uh, brilliant mind, absolutely incredibly brilliant mind. Um, if you have any interest at all, he's got the, his works have been translated. We've got them here. You can get them on Amazon. They're cheap, um, and they will uh, show you why we're dealing with the falsity of uh, climate change now. It, they've hijacked a lot of Vern Vernadsky's stuff to try and pump up their ideas to control us, the Kazarians, the name stealers. So it's also interrelated, just gets, they, they steal in science, they try and obscure science from you so that you can't benefit from it, and they can. They're very evil people. This is part of the Cathari experience, that there's good and evil in the universe, and, and it's necessary that we resist evil. It's part of our task. Anyway, in the 1920s, we get William Reich and uh, Vernadsky, right? And William Reich discovered what he called orgone. He didn't discover orgone. He discovered biophotonics, biophotons, but he didn't know it was light. Uh, he thought it was this uh, intervening uh, quasi-electrical thing that he called orgone because he had no sensors that would tell him it was light. He died in 1957. In 1955, some guys started creating this device that was a photomultiplier, and they discovered that every cell in your body emits light, deals with light constantly. And if we analyze now what we know, we know that only light is fast enough to coordinate this. So we're like hard light. Um, it just, like... It's just light everywhere, right? And so what's interesting, of course, is that within the Cathar tradition, all of the, the or not, yes, I think every single one of the, of the ritual sayings of the songs of the Cathar discuss light uh, as, the, as a primal energy. Now, having read my Boscovich uh, and understanding the ether, I understand that light is a modality of the ether, and I understand how that modality is being expressed in, in creating our bodies and so on. And so, all right, so long, 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 long thing here, working up towards med beds. Med beds won't use electricity. They won't use the Skinar approach because it's too fucking slow and too crude, uh, much too crude. So if we were to examine it speed-wise, relative speed-wise, if we were, instead of, this is 10,000 using light, if we were to try and use electricity, or 100,000 using light, uh, if we were trying to use electricity, we could barely manage a tenth of that, 10,000 interactions in a second. So, so electricity is, is Let's just think of it this way. The speed of electricity within flesh is still, uh, at its best, only going to be about 10% of what you can achieve with light. And this is why biophotonics is so offering so much promise. Now, as a discipline, as a science now, biophotonics is going off in the wrong direction because of the effects of the Khazarians, because it's been, uh, because the, the, what they call the academy, uh, the, the Academy of Arts and Sciences has been captured by the Khazarians. It was firmly captured in the 1920s, actually the 1890s, but I won't go into that. But by 1920, they were really solidified and they could put anybody into any position in the academy and control the direction from that point on. And they did so. The Khazarians 
infiltrated the academy all over in Britain, and from there they spread out through into Germany, into America, all over the place, and they're just polluting our history like mad, just continuously polluting the history. Um, another thing that the Cathars like is really good history, okay? And so we get pissed at these name stealers. Anyway, so from the 1920s, we've all been fucked about these kinds of things, but we've had this science of biophotonics that's been developing. But right now, that science is heading off into a wrong direction, in my opinion, okay? That it's going into diagnostics, where they're, they're, and that's pretty good. You can do a lot of good diagnostics with biophotonics. So for instance, in biophotonics, insofar as they understand it now, the, um, the main deal is coherence, okay? And so they can tell now, uh, some of the people in the biophotonics world can take a particular chemical and they can, that's brand new, and they can run it through an algorithm in a computer and determine that this chemical is cancer causing. And they can determine this without that chemical ever having been in any human body or any animal body. And they can say with a very high degree of probability, okay, so this new chemical XYZ is cancer causing and they, they can determine this because that chemical, uh, when, when light bounces off of it, it becomes incoherent, it scatters, okay? The photons like s uh, separate and, and become diff diffuse in a way that is not good. Um, and, that, and that if they see uh, the potential for this particular chemical to scatter and be um, incoherent in its light, then they know it's cancer causing because there is a, the single aspect of biophotonics that is important for the human and, and all other animal bodies is coherency that it's got to be coherent. Now, we can get into the definition of coherent in terms of the uh, biophotonics and so on, but we're not going to do that at the moment. A lot of this actually goes back to the, or has, it has analogs within the um, Cathari uh, understanding of the Elohim and what they did in these uh, bio bubbles, in, the, in their bio labs, okay? So, uh, Anyway, <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I do have to get some stuff done. We're almost at an hour here. This is going to be a long one, and, and I'll probably end up trying to write something about the uh, about all of this in terms of at least the history of the Cathari. But what I'll do is I'll put some links in there for some history that I know has some validity to it, right? Almost every article I read about the Cathars is basically about two-thirds wrong. Um, they may have some of the historical facts right, but they're not Cathari, they're not in that tradition, and, in, and that tradition has basically disappeared from the planet in any formal understanding, and it was never that written down in that formal anyway, as that was one of the, the precepts was that knowledge is uh, transitory, that what we know today won't necessarily be valid tomorrow, so you drop it. So the Cathari understood the woo, I mean, that's part of it, right? Um, All different, all different kinds of stuff that are relative to med bins, but here's the thing. We will have them. Uh, they will exist. I'm convinced that they'll have electric motors that will use uh, electricity to shape magnetic fields, and that magnetic fields will be used in um, uh, dealing with the coherency issues of light, okay? That's because magnetism and light are both modalities of the ether, and you can use one to affect the other. So if you have a very strong magnetic field, like super strong, like off of one of these big mother magnets, right? Um, uh, you can actually uh, image that field and shoot a laser through it and cause the image of the field to be distorted by the laser. By the particles of light traveling through that field, it will actually cause that field to interact and alter. You can also, you can't bend um, laser light, you can, you can do it to some extent. You can alter laser light with magnetic fields uh, especially interference uh, patterns that are generated by uh, cross magnetic field connections, you can alter light uh, f even from a laser, even though coherency. Now, um, laser stands for um, uh, light as an aspect of stimulated emission of radiation, okay? Uh, that, so there, a laser is trying to form coherency. Now, our bodies form coherency in our light naturally, and it, 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 when you're ill, your light becomes incoherent, it becomes scattered and this kind of thing. And so the theory is, anyway, that at some point we would be able to do things to un un or to make our, our light more coherent uh, and this sort of thing. Now, let me tell you that I know of one plant that, that is able to, that's the only plant they've tested out of thousands, and I think we're up to like two or 3,000 plants that have actually been physically tested now, and, and many of the others are being modeled by computers. There's some big discrepancy between actual plant material and the computer models of them, so it's best to check the plant itself. There's only one plant that um, we found that actually increases the coherency of your light, and um, 
Uh, this plant is a deadly fucking poison that will just trash you evilly uh, if you get involved with it, but it's also one of the central plants involved in alchemy and has had a, at least in my opinion, because of what I've been able to research, at least a 1200 year history, and it's probably closer to 1800 years in the alchemical traditions of being investigated. And it killed a lot of alchemists, right? So how they knew that this particular plant, which I won't name, because people go off and kill themselves with it, uh, how they knew that it would make your, your vibration, your light uh, more coherent, I do not know. I don't know how the alchemists tumbled to this, but they did. And they've tried everything to make the plant useful, but so far, no luck. People that have gotten into it have really caused themselves serious problems. Uh, you know, at light level, fucking with light is, is not easy, okay? And so this is one of those things where, uh, this is why I get really upset with Charlie Ward, uh, the name stealer, the stench of him, and Simon Parks and the stench of him, right? They really stink to me. Uh, it's because they're trying to say that the med beds exist now. They're trying to, to, to aggrandize themselves and make themselves richer by deceiving you that this technology could exist now. We'll make it up, we'll, we'll create it, we'll invent it, I know this, and it'll be magnetic, uh, altering the, uh, the function of the light within the body. But even with magnets, you gotta be really, really, really careful. These are very, very low power magnets of a specific known Gauss rate uh, for my arthritis, and they work great. I can do typing and all that kind of stuff, right? It, it works really fine. Um, but you, you can't, a big magnet will fuck you over. If I get too close to these things, I get big magnets over here that are, you know, the size of this box or bigger. And if I even handle those, I might not sleep for 24 hours. Uh, the fields are that, that strong. So this is something that we, we can't just throw a human into a, a bed from a s supposed space alien and expect that that thing is gonna correct him. Just isn't, isn't gonna happen. This stuff is extremely dangerous. You're not gonna be shooting yourself full of electricity to try and cure things because electricity is too, too crude. And we have yet to determine how to effectively operate uh, biophotonics for a repair part of the body, but we will. And when we do get it, it'll be very much like tanning beds, I suspect, that you'll just go lie down in there in the machinery with some AI in it. And, oh my God, Kerry Cassidy will just be so freaked out, but there will be AI in this bed because you're gonna need complex computer programs to control all of the magnets just to be able to do the work on you. And, and they will exist. They don't now. Charlie Ward is full of shit. Simon Parks is full of shit. I haven't, I haven't watched any of their stuff for a long time. And uh, I don't know if they're still touting med beds, but they were really into it for a long period. Um, I happen to know some stuff about um, Simon Parks and the um, Connecting Consciousness group, okay? Uh, his criminal gang. Um, many of those people in his group don't know they're part of a criminal organization. Um, they'll find out as investigations go forward and his whole connecting consciousness thing is just gonna bust up because of what's gonna happen, especially here in the United States. Um, and especially in the legal actions that are, that are pending. Uh, but, so, but we still have the stench of Simon Parks and we still have the stench of Charlie Ward out there saying med beds exist now, they're hidden from you, the military's got them and so on. And it's like people, this is the same kind of thing about clones. Clones, we, we have Dolly the sheep, right? And so they cloned a sheep and they made Dolly. But what they did was they made Dolly as a gamete and then they let that, those cells double until they got a whole sheep out of it. The sheep was born as a lamb and it grew up. So we, can, we could clone uh, uh, Biden right now, okay? But here's what would happen. We would have Biden right now, we'd take some of his cells and we'd clone him. Then we would have to wait for 80 fucking years for him to grow up so that we could substitute him out and the other Biden would have died 80, you know, uh, 70 some odd years back. So we do not, we have no ability to control time. So we can't take cells from, from Biden, stick them into a test tube and have them double, double, double in a gons. We don't control time the way the Elohim did. The Elohim had bubbles, giant bubbles that encompassed huge area of the planet. These bubbles distorted time such that people could live to be a thousand years old. Even with today's um, bodies, you would live to be a thousand years old within those bubbles. Why? Because within those bubbles where the Elohim stuck themselves, they had that in energy affecting the coherence of their internal light. This was known to the Cathari. If you read all of the historical literature from any of the areas that uh, we had these centers. So there's historical literature from the Olmec region, from the Central America, from uh, South America, and we have the, the Middle East areas, we ha and, and then the um, India and so on, right? Where we have literature that comes out. If you read any of that literature discussing what was going on, including the Bible, which is just limited to just the Jews. It was never intended to be applied to all of humanity. And in fact, it was just the Jews versus all of humanity because they were the slaves of Yahweh and Yahweh was at odds with all of these other tribes and stuff and the other Gons, the other Elohim. They fought among themselves using us. Maybe it was a game to them, I don't know. Anyway, but all of these uh, stories 
all go to the expulsion of the garden, to going through the veil, okay, leaving the gons, leaving the bubble. Once you did that, you had pain, you had suffering, you had death. All you had to do was to go back and be a willing slave of the Elohim. Now, they would kill you. They, they, would, they had such abilities that their archangels, who are their enforcers, okay, sort of like the Capitol Police, uh, you know, the, the SS, the, you know, the, the Azov brigade, brigade, they're the enforcers for the Elohim. The archangels are so fierce beings that they could take their finger and push it right through your skull. Fuck you up. Okay, and in fact, Archangel Michael uh, insisted on people creating uh, cathedrals to him at specific points around the planet, and when these people refused, boink, finger right through the skull. And you see that, you say, okay, yeah, no, no worries, dude, I'll start working on that fucker first thing in the morning. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, so here we are. Um, when you leave the Gons, you leave that bubble, okay? Within that bubble, there is coherency for your light, irrespective of what your body is doing. You don't have disease. You don't have pain in childbirth. You don't have pain in, uh, in basically anything. The stories that come out of the Olmecs in the, um, the translated versions of the stuff in Mexico and, and down into the, um, uh, the Incas in Peru and so on, their histories um, talk about people that have had incredible fucking surgeries without pain and walking around the next day because it was done in the Gons, right? And they're talking, uh, and we even find some, uh, even now, we will come across the Egyptian mummies that have got steel, stainless steel rods in their, in their bones, healing them up. And uh, so there was some heavy duty stuff going on during this period of time within these areas. Uh, so much of our history is obscured, so much of our history is distorted deliberately by the Cathar Cathar Cathariens, <laughs> that the Cath Cathari uh, are one of the few traditions, and it mostly wasn't written down, that preserved this um, alternative view of what had happened. So anyway, so here we are now. And uh, the point being that I do suspect that we're on the cusp of uh, developing technology that will lead to med beds and that will discover a method of using magnets. Now, okay, so there's this uh, guy, um, I'm gonna butcher his name, Is it Bruno, I think, uh, Baticardi, something like that. Uh, I just don't remember. He's a professor, he's the uh, eminent professor of uh, medicine in Italy, and this guy has come up with this method of oscillating magnetic uh, fields that will, will actually retrieve functioning. They'll, they'll take a diabetic uh, leg that is uh, to gangrene, to the state of gangrene, cannot be operated on. If they operate on it at all, the flesh will fall off and that leg will be lost and the person will die. So they can't operate on it. All they can do is give you drugs to keep going and try and recover uh, some level of function to keep you moving. So you, but you've got gangrene and they can only chop it off and keep reducing the leg, right? This guy in Italy is able to use magnets, uh, specific power, low power, oscillating the various different um, um, uh, orientations of the magnetic field, and he can recover circulation, and he can recover flesh rebuilding and destroy the gangrene and bring it up to the point where that leg could be operated on safely and recover. And he's doing it with magnets. Now, he's doing it in a biophotonic way. He's trying to alter the, uh, the coherence, and he's successful. And so from his work and from other stuff that's been going on since the 1920s, I suspect that we will be getting close to, to a breakthrough now that we're getting into this period of um, uh, new innovation, now that we're breaking out of the Khazarian um, central bank controlled uh, prison that we've been in since the 1920s, right? When the central banks took over all of the planet. They started with the Federal Reserve and then they just kept going and going and going and all the planet has now been colonized. Globalism is colonization and we're all colonies of the, of the Khazarian globalists. Now we're fighting them and, and this dictatorship is gonna go down. So Dan Andrews in, in, uh, in uh, Australia, uh, he's going down. Now will it get to the point where they haul him out like Ceausescu and, and shoot him in the street? Maybe, I don't know. You know, the Australians are gonna get real pissed with the shit that's gonna happen. They're, they're right now they're trying to say that Australians can't grow their own food. Uh, pretty soon they're gonna say that Australians do not own their own children and that all children have to be given over to the state. That I think is gonna cause the, the revolution in Australia in the, in the um, the revolt, okay, and it's gonna be ugly because these people don't have um, uh, surgical weapons. So the Australians will have to fight back with improvised explosives and these kind of things, and it will be very, very, very ugly for everybody involved. It will be final though, they'll settle it. Anyway though, uh, so we're at a very um, uh, key period of time, and I'm just basically saying, in spite of all the chaos that's coming, in spite of the collapse of the fiat currency system and the great depressions and all of that kind of stuff that's gonna happen, this is gonna be a good time because we will free lots of minds um, from these uh, delusions and that will allow us to approach things rationally and we will have rapid um, 
refinement of our ideas, and then we'll also start investigating history, and we'll go back to some of these good ideas and, and go from there. Uh, so we'll go back before Einstein, go back over to Tesla, and come forward and drop all of the Einstein name-stealing shit, drop all of this quantum crap, which is bullshit, um, and go back to an understanding of the ether, and really progress now, right, um, as we get forward into this. It's going to be a very exciting period of time, and it's going to be a very work-filled period of time, and chaos. Lots of fucking chaos as we get into this war. Now, there will be people that will just be out there working and letting the war go on around them and that kind of stuff. And it is from those people that we will start progressing towards uh, uh, devices that will start aiding us. So it'll be like an individual form of a gons in the sense that, you know, a little bubble that will, will get you back to coherency. Now, as soon as you leave the bubble, you'll start becoming incoherent again in terms of encountering all of the pollution and so on in the, in the environment that caused these kinds of things. But still, this approach will be of aid to us, and we will ultimately get to the point where we do have um, health care in the form of a med bed. But, in, in, but it's polluted. You know, we've got the name stealers, we've got Charlie Ward, Simon Parks, name stealing all the fucking gone all around and polluting our history and polluting our language and, and uh, shitting all over everything, uh, trying to make money and aggrandize themselves uh, from uh, the idea of med beds, right? Um, I don't blame them. That's just the way they are. They're grifters. They can't help it. And uh, it's just their expression. But I don't have to support them. I don't have to go along with them. I don't have to acknowledge that they're anything other than name stealers. And that, so I don't deal with name stealers, right? And Charlie Ward's threatened. He's a, he's, he makes threats all the fucking time to have crews come and visit people that say bad words about him. And, uh, you know, I've got people that have sent stalkers against me, and I'm still here. I've got people that have sent lawyers against me, and I'm still here. I won. You know, uh, Corey Good is a fucktard and a, and a low information shithead. Uh, and he's going to lose. He's in a great deal of stress. His body's been trashed by this year because the stress is, is building on him now that he's creeping closer to this ultimate <laughs> smackdown by the courts. And then he's in a shitty position, and he brought it on himself. Um, and that's where we're at now. Uh, the deep state is in that shitty position. They can't get out of it, and it's going to become chaotic over this next year and a half or so. Um, good chaos for us to watch them uh, puke their guts out in fear and run around and shit themselves and try and deny it. Uh, but it's not going to be pleasant for the rest of us, for anybody, as we go through it all. But I'm here to tell you that on the other side of it, uh, we will accomplish great things, hugely great things. We're going to rebuild the manufacturing base in the United States and do it smart. We won't have the central banks uh, incentivizing waste and, and destruction. And so we'll be able to do things in a much better fashion. And we will see a huge revival in uh, the United States, in America, that will, in essence, save the whole planet. And in about let's say seven years, by 2028 or so, right, um, we will get into, uh, because I'm counting from a ways back, uh, we'll get into a period, we'll have had five years of no central bank by that point, and, uh, and no central currency that we have to deal with, and uh, the speed of recover, recovery will be blinding, uh, it'll be, you know, five really grueling, grueling years of very hard work, and then even at the end of five years, we'll be able to say, wow, look how much we've accomplished in such a short period of time, what will the next five years bring? And so it's just going to be great. It's just going to be glorious that way. And I'm actually anticipating, uh, I actually see the conflict with the central bank, with the Khazarians, as being a very good thing uh, because the conflict is resolving. It's getting it out and, it's, and we're dealing with it. Uh, so I do not uh, withdraw or shy away from conflict. I love contention. I love to fight because of that resolution. And so this is a good period for me. And also, uh, it's a good period because, hey, I can actually get in here. We're dealing with the technology I understand. And so I'm going to investigate biophotonics with the idea of skewing us back, putting out stuff that takes us back to using biophotonics as a repair mechanism, not simply an, uh, yet another diagnostic tool uh, for the corrupt um, medical system, the big pharma system, right? Big pharma hates biophotonics because they can't make any money on it. There's nothing for them to produce. They can't sell you something to put into your body that you then have to become dependent on. And so they're doing everything they can to suppress this technology and relegate it off into oh, like an x-ray. You know, you just go and get your biophotonic uh, assay of your body and then that's it. No, good guys, the same technology that can do that assay can change the biophotonic coherence of your body and cure you. Uh, it's just a matter of developing that ability now, developing the machinery that will do it. So anyway, so this is one of the many projects I'm on. Uh, we're starting our um, road and bridge work as of June. We're doing the prep work for it now. And then we'll push on in after uh, July when we have to uh, shut down on that part of it because of the law and the stream and stuff. We're going to move over to working on the property there and start cutting off a flat spot to sort of start building a house. Now, the real estate market is shitting itself all over, okay? The, the <coughs> central bank raised the rates a half a point. Okay, so uh, they raised the, the rates here one quarter point just a little while ago, and that translates up to a 4% increase in mortgage rates. 
Um, now they raised it up one half, and that's going to raise us up, should bring us up to about 9%. Uh, in mortgage rates. So we'll see that on the 12th, I think. We'll see by around May 12th or so, we'll see somewhere between 8 and 9%. But I'm already being told by real estate guys that just this right here, this gap right here that's now creeping up, has cut out about half to two thirds of the people in the real estate market. They're saying, no, I don't want to screw with this, uh, you know, because I have to downsize what I want to be uh, in a house because the amount of money I have to pay is going up so much. This is causing a lot of uh, the housing builders to also run into crises. So there's going to be a flood of houses that are partially completed that are just dumped onto the market because the, the spec builder can't, can't go. Or maybe it's now a spec house because he's two thirds of the way complete on the house, but the buyer is backed out because he only had a certain amount of interest money on it and he decided to just take the loss rather than get into a situation where he's paying 9% or higher uh, on a mortgage that, that you know, at the time he started his build was down here at 1% or 2%. Because it had been down here at 1% before the, the one quarter point in, in, uh, interest rate increased by the Fed. So now in the 70s, Volcker had to take us up to interest rates that were in the 20% range, or mortgage rates. The, the interest rate was set such that it produced mortgage rates of about 20%, and that's what cured inflation in the 70s. They won't have that options now. When they go to the next half point, it will crash the real estate market and kill it totally. Uh, it's going to crush uh, commercial lending. Uh, commercial real estate is just going to shit itself and, and die. So right now you might find a floor in a building like, um, you know, I don't know, Sears Tower. Just, just pick some famous building somewhere and say, okay, that floor right now, uh, maybe it rents for a quarter of a million dollars a month for this particular business, okay? Or a quarter of a million dollars a year or something, right? In, in rental on that, that floor for all of these people to work there. Well, as the interest rates go up, that business is going to die. Those people won't work there anymore. The commercial real estate will go bust. And maybe a year from now or two years from now, you might be able to get that whole floor for $1,200 a year and turn it into a house, right? That's the kind of thing we're headed into. It's that level of Great Depression. It's planetary. Um, it's going to be horrific in that level. But it's not a static thing. As the Great Depression is coming down, you're going to find people like myself that are doing things to raise up. So that's why, long story, that's why I'm continuing with the uh, project out on my timberland. I'm not particularly, the price of wood's going up and I'll make some money on the lumber, which actually I'm not going to make money on the, on the timber. I'm going to recoup the cost of putting in the, the road and the bridge, some of it anyway, and get the uh, site for the house built up there. And then we can start building the house. Now, the reason for me to do that is there's going to be a lot of people needing work. And so I will be able to do my part by giving uh, skilled craftsmen continuing work in building a house uh, that, I, you know, I've got the crypto money, so I'm just going to build the house, right? I want to put a place on that property. It's, it's brutal out there, right? So it's no country for old men. Uh, I got a lot of people here. They're saying you're a crazy fucker, Cliff. You know, you're an old guy. You shouldn't do it. It's too steep. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's beautiful. Blah 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 blah. But another thing too is that even if it, uh, even if I die before the house is completed, it will have benefited uh, the local community in the sense that it will keep people employed and we will build something. We will work, right? So it's back to the idea of work is its own reward. Work is its own satisfaction, and it also produces stuff. And uh, so on that note, I've got to go do some of that, right? Sorry, guys. It, it went real long. It's a very complex subject. Um, the history alone uh, for the Cathars and how it's the, the history has interacted and their understanding of the planet uh, of civilization moving from the west over to the east uh, could take days of discussion. And I've got a lot of work. I'm entering in some new projects. I've also got to educate myself. I've got to do a, um, a literature uh, review, which is extensive. It takes a long time to read through a lot of books and articles and stuff on biophotonics. And I've got to be able to separate it, find out who's worth following and so on. Then I've got to go all the way back to um, Bernadsky. And uh, I'm discounting Reich, okay? William Reich's work is, is good, it's seminal, but it's flawed in that he didn't know he was describing biophotonics and thought he was describing something out further in the ether. So his conclusions were wrong, so I can disregard him. Vernadsky is different, though. Vernadsky understood from the other side what coherence could do relative to ecosphere, noosphere, uh, biosphere, et cetera. And so I'll pick up from Vernadsky's work um, and move forward in biophotonics uh, until current, and then I'll, I'll be current with all of the equipment and so forth here. And then I can see how to kind of gently shove uh, in the direction of repair, not just simply diagnostics, because I know the Khazarians, the evil big fuckers in big pharma, and the central banks have incentivized uh, the relegation of biophotonics off into merely yet another diagnostic system, right? So I'm actually going to work, in a, in a way, on trying to push science towards creating the med beds that the big stinkers, Charlie Ward and Simon Parks, are touting existing now. Um, and there's absolutely no evidence. And we would see if med beds existed, you could bet your ass that, that uh, Pelosi would not look as Pelosi looks, and nor would Hillary Clinton be as she is now. Okay, um, I know this. <laughs> so I know this. And so I know that med beds don't exist to the point where they're allowed even to that level, to those kinds of people. Um, anyway, though, so I'll put a couple of links to the uh, cathars in here. And uh, I apologize for the length. I really have to get moving now and get some stuff done. I'm going to be off grid for months as we get into these other projects, including the bridge and, um, and these other things I've got going. Uh, in my research. So this may be the last video for some period of time, and I gotta do this too. You know, if you need to sleep, pure sleep, especially if you're a young guy with um, sleep problems, really does hate, aid things. And I'll put, a, I'll put a link into it down there as well. I think that's it. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, be well, uh, and stay well as possible, because we will get to the point where med beds pop up, right? So we'll make it a little bit easier on all of us. And um, stay woo, guys.
All right. If you stayed with us uh, through all of that. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that is some um, deep, deep woo that we've been getting into. Isn't it? Isn't it fascinating, though? It's a pretty fascinating woo. Don't you think? I think it's some pretty fascinating woo. Alrighty. Well, I certainly am pooped. I am pooped and scooped. So, all right. And, uh, let's see, I'll probably see you guys later. Like, again, you know, trying to stream more often. So we'll do more conspiracy theory streams. And we're, we'll get deeper and deeper into it. Time goes on.